hit it. It's Friday, January 21st, 2022, episode 165. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we have the great pleasure to welcome to the show Alex Gurevich to talk about his new book, The Trades of March 2020, A Shield Against Uncertainty. Folks, you don't want to miss this one. Alex said someone should write a book about the market during the COVID crisis, and when no one else did, Alex stepped up to the plate. If you want to know what it's like to be a hedge fund manager during a market crisis, then this is the conversation for you. Then this week, we have a special segment of Cuppy's Corner where Cuppy takes the helm and interviews his buddy Mark Moss to chat about markets. We're going to hit to to some charts and talk some talking charts as well. Uh, We're keeping the show a little shorter format this week, but stay tuned next week when we're back to our normal format. So stick around. We've got a great show. Let's get to our first interview with Alex. It's our great pleasure to welcome to the show Alex Gurevich. Alex, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been uh, it's been a while since we've uh, chatted on various <laughs> media, but it's the first time that we actually talk one person that's, to person, which is exciting. That, that, that's correct. Uh, people are always trying to get us to uh, get together and debate the bond market because I am a notorious bear and you are a notorious bull. But the real reason we have you on today is because I just read your book, The Trades of March 2020, A Shield Against Uncertainty, and I loved it. And I'm going to tell you something that uh, that I haven't felt in a long time. It reminded me of reading The Alchemy of Finance by George Soros. Thank you. That's a good comparison. It was it was it was great. And so for those who don't know it, it's it's almost a play by play of Alex's uh, experiences during the COVID leading up and going through the COVID crisis. Can I ask what what was the impetus to writing this book? So interestingly, it started almost like a joke. I remember the actual days of March, and I remember saying things like, you know, every day this month of March 2020 feels like a whole month. Every <laughs> single day is like a month. I was even joking that like, well, by this measure, the duration of the bear market was kind of normal. <laughs> a couple of weeks <laughs> There's like a couple of years, right? <laughs> because everything was so fast, right? Oh. And then uh, I I kind of joked, well, someone has to write a book about it. And, you and a few you... months later, it's like, well, it could be me. And and it's a terrific book. And for those who don't know, he, he Alex goes through his macro trading. And what I love about it is it's very detailed. And you're very open about a lot of the different things. You open up about all the stress that you're feeling. You open up about your positions, the things you got wrong. Was that was that was that difficult to to have that amount of honesty in in your writing? Honestly, it was a little bit of a decision to uh, that we coped her with uh, both myself and a little bit. I had to discuss it with a team, just how much we're going to publish, whether we're going to publish everything. And I felt a lot of power in publishing everything. So people would have no um, kind of back thought, oh, well, maybe this is somehow cherry picked. Maybe only the good trades are discussed. I think overall, I have a pretty easy time sharing my mistakes. I think when we do investor meetings, my team sometimes says, you don't have to be so humble. You don't have to always talk about what you screwed up. <laughs> my my bias is to actually go through things and say like, well, this is the mistake I made. This, I should have done this. This, I should have done differently. And I think it is very important for people who especially like new to trading and learning it to realize that uh, even on your best year as a trader, you make tons of horrible mistakes. Right. And I think this, I think I wanted to illustrate this because I want. I had. I felt like I was on a. Maybe it was easier for me to do it because I was, at least for 2020, for that specific year, I was in a position of power. I had a good year, so it was easy for me psychologically to say yes, I did well. But look, all all those things that I struggled with. I think if it was a bad year, it would be much more pressure to do something like that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so I'm going to read some uh, quotes from the book, and we'll go through it, and I'd love to just kind of discuss it in in greater detail. And one of the things that was a little bit of a light bulb moment for me was this quote and the way you set up your book and what that means for uh, operating from a position, position of strength. So I'll quote from the book. For years preceding the pandemic crisis, 
my portfolio was slightly negatively correlated to the stock market and other risk assets. This bias allowed me to buy anything that looked cheap at any point. I never had to worry about owning equity indices, oil, or emerging market currencies. When those assets collapsed, I was almost certain to make money on the huge interest rate positions. Okay. Uh, can you, first of all, can you comment about that? I, I, I found that fascinating. Well, the thinking, the origin of this thinking is really risk parity, if you think about it. And uh, I actually claim to be one of the early adopters of risk parity. It became such a common uh, phrase, and I will explain what it is in a second for broad audience. Uh, possibly first people to pioneer were people like Cliff Asnes or Ray Dalio, but I started it pretty early. I started in 2002 in JP Morgan. We had no idea that anyone else was doing risk parity, and of course, I had no idea of this term risk parity. I had a very different, um, very different uh, words for it and different approach for it, but that's uh, I did an internal presentation at the JP Morgan in 2002. And the idea is that if you own bonds, if you're continuously long fixed income, it acts as a put on your equities because the moment something goes wrong with risk assets, you make money because interest rates go down. Uh, because eventually, if there is a recession, the Fed would always cut rates and but actually bonds would rally right away in anticipation of that, so you would make money. And the great thing about this hedge is that unlike all the other hedges, which are usually buying puts or something like this, which you bleed and lose money when nothing happens, you actually make money by owning bonds because the yield curves were chronically upward sloping, which was one of the greatest insanities of world financial markets, the upward sloping yield curve in the developed world. I think that was one of the greatest financial bonanzas in the history of humanity. The idea that like 30-year yield is chronically higher than 2-year yield in the U.S. in the environment when rates actually over time go down. If you just really think about this insanity, U.S. government gave away hundreds of billions of dollars to traders by doing this. <laughs> uh, by having... Sorry to interrupt. That's a fascinating way of thinking about it. Now, that though is just assuming that you're going to be continually in a bond bull market. Do you ever worry that in a bond bear market that it might not work? And and also um, getting back to your other question, the like the, the risk parity, I kind of taken us off to- topic a little bit, but the risk parity, do you think that's going to break down if, in a bond bear market? Like, do you worry about those relationships stopping? Oh, definitely. And you definitely have to reassess those relationships. But we had 40 years of bull market. And throughout this whole bull market, the bull yield curve was fighting it. There will be a point when the bull market will be over, and you always have to be cognizant of that. But when, you know, it's like if you're a trader who for 40 years trades against the trends, you really should reassess your strategy. <laughs> That's at least my opinion. <laughs> you know, a few years ago, somebody tweeted, uh, said on Twitter, over the last 20 years, the markets have com- conspired to prevent all intelligent traders from making money. <laughs> And I kind of answered, well, if uh, traders were dumbfounded by those markets for 20 years, you kind of have to question the term intelligence, right? Yeah. It's like the traders that complain about the Fed um, buying all the assets and causing the stock markets to go up. And then you say, well, I guess you're long the stock market. And they just kind of look at you blankly. Not a chance. Um, One of the things that I love about your thinking, Alex, is that so often, and this is one of my pet peeves, people will look at an asset at, at a price and they won't incorporate the carry into the into that asset's return. So, for example, one of them one of them that I love talking about is the the CNH, the Chinese renminbi. Everyone will look and think that they're trading the price and, and that 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 they're geniuses because they're shorting the the renminbi and they're making money. But they're little do they realize that if they did it in real life, they would be losing on the carry. That was um, something that. Is is prevalent through your whole book? Do you agree that that's probably one of the largest mistakes that a beginning macro trader might make? It is definitely a big factor, and it is exacerbated by the fact that a lot of research, a lot of stuff that you see from economic research that you read, whether it comes from banks or research, it's all like price based oh, because yeah. researchers don't actually hold positions. They say like, "Oh, this is support, this is resistance, this looks high, this looks low." But there are stronger examples. I mean, I like CNH example, and 
I've been venturing into being shot CNH from time to time and with very mixed success, I will tell you right now. <laughs> but uh, there are things like Turkish Lira, the example I gave in my first book. So my first book, The Next Perfect Trade, came out a few years ago where I laid out the uh, fundamental strategic principles that I'm using for trading, how I tra select trades. And I gave example of Turkish Lira, which it seems like it's always losing, it's always in devaluation. Right. But you actually, when you factor carry, you actually make money over years on holding Turkish lira, and make money pretty continuously. So uh, unless, so if you buy Turkish lira every time it blows out, it's been a great trade right. over over years. Um, and uh, recently, such example. Sorry, just I want to give one more no example. Problem. Recently, uh, inflation index bonds were such example. It seems uh. like oh yeah, they corrected in price, but. It, if you actually calculate how much they made last year, they actually made the inflation carry was 7% last year. So if you had negative 1% yield, they they earned you 6% in carry last year. And that's because the people are not realizing that the that the principal value of the, of the actual bond is increasing by the amount of inflation. Yes. And that's actually a great segue to what one of the your big trades in the book was you – went and actually were long inflation bonds uh, in the in the kind of vortex or the black hole, as you call it, of the COVID crisis. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience about trading those during this uh, period? Well, this is this is an example where I use what I call like the subtitle of my book, of my current book. It's called like the trades of March 2020, but a subtitle is a shield against uncertainty. Now, when you're in the middle of a crisis, Honestly, you could pretend to be a pandemic expert all you want to, but you don't really know what's going to happen next. And you have to live with it. You don't know when, uh, how bad is, things are going to get, how many people will die, when, what kind of shutdowns, lockdowns, restrictions you're going to face. You don't even know if you're going to get sick yourself. So you're facing all of those uncertainties. Now, how to trade through this? You need to look a little outside and think like what is certain what is going to happen not over the course of the next few weeks what's the point we don't know that anyway uh but over the course of next few years i think if, if you if i may i want to focus on a very important philosophical point that i feel trips up a lot of traders very often i hear from traders this is a very dangerous environment and i can trade it only tactically i can only hold short-term positions because things are so volatile and uncertain Right. In my opinion, that's exactly wrong. I very seldom tell people your strategy and your approach is wrong, because my yeah, because my whatever makes money, right? I don't care if you trade every second, you make money, or if I trade every ten years, I make money. This is the only thing that can really um, that can really like eventually be the judge, right? Have you oh, made yeah. money? At, However, the end of the, at the end of the day, all your P and L is all that matters, right? Yeah, P and L all that matters. But I think this is one place where I think the thinking is people trips them up and cost them money. If you start thinking the environment is uncertain and therefore I have to trade short term, I think this is fallacious. The if short term is environment is uncertain, why would you trade short term? If right. you think that you don't know if stock market is going to gap up or down. 10% in the next few hours like it was on during COVID crisis, why would you be short a long stock market for that time horizon? Why wouldn't you just say, okay, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few days, but what is certain about 2023? What is certain about 2024? Will, so, what, so, what was certain, it's certain uh, that liquidity will be added. Right, okay. So uh, when you looked at, and uh, when you looked at the totality of instruments and in a chaos instruments various financial instruments trade in a very disconnected way and if you looked at where asset swaps were trading where bonds versus swaps versus inflation index bonds were trading the prices were really insane the structures i think there's a moment when i say something like half seriously we should just dump our entire portfolio and put it all on inflation index bonds because <laughs> I, they were so mispriced the mispricing of them in the middle of uh, March was one of the greatest misprices I've seen of any financial instrument. And this is a lot to say. I mean, there are other misprices, but this is one of the greatest misprices of a financial instrument that happened with inflation index bonds in 2020. I mean, they implied 
kind of transactions you could enter if you put all the pieces and legs together just made absolutely no sense. Like there was really no path uh, that could lead to that type of weird interaction. So, Alex, I, I must say, as a fellow that went into that crisis, long break-evens, like I was long the inflation, short the bonds, I can, can concur that the pricing made no sense. And I was on the other side trying to make, like trying desperately to get through it because I was getting margin called as my bonds that I was a little short, like I was short bond futures, where it went limit up or what, or went straight up and my tips went straight down and there was no bids. So thank God for guys like you that came in and fixed that. And that kind of brings me back to my, your original point was that, I I love the idea that you have this long fixed income approach, but then you're willing and able, and that's the most important point, you're able to take advantage of the dislocations. So you don't wait, you don't try to put the trades on ahead of time. You're long almost a form of cash, let's just say. It's not cash, it's actually a yielding instrument and you figure out a way to earn a yield. And then you take advantage when there's these major dislocations such as the tips. My question to you is, over the years, how how important has the picking up those really cheap assets been in terms of the contributor of your returns? Like, would you say that almost that's more important than the other part of the day-to-day trading? Mm, I don't know if it is more important, but I think it is it is important in terms of portfolio building. And I will say that, like, really a lot of my long-term success was based on the fact that I was able to buy assets in 2009. Right. And the fact that my strategic system allowed me in March 2009 to have every penny I had in stocks. Right. And which, the fact that in co- March 2020, good. I was able to be all in. And those just two junctures in my career that I was able to go all in made a lot of difference in terms of what I have right now. Yeah. And, and I, I completely, when I read the book, I realized this. I was like, oh, that's great. That's like Howard Marks when he goes and he creates a fund, but he says, uh, I just want this money on standby. And eventually, at some point, I'm going to call these pension funds and all these clients that have promised me money, and I will put it to work. But in the meantime, I'm not going to do anything because assets are fairly priced. And to me, it's almost like you've created a synthetic call because uh, call in terms of capital call because you're always in a position of strength when you need to be. Yes, that is definitely my bias. Having said that, I may have some trades on. And any given time, which would be, I would call positive beta trades, like which carry positively or somehow benefit when things are normal. But I've been always trying to balance the portfolio. Part of my thinking was always that um, if you really think what the purpose of me as an instrument, if, for example, you look at it as an investor, if imagine that let's not even talk about institutional investor. Let's look at a person with wealthy individual with family office. Naturally, you have uh, houses or house or houses or whatever you own, right? You can have your real estate, you can have your stocks, you probably have some startup investments, maybe you have some money tied up in the company you launched, maybe you have a yacht, I don't know what people have, right? But a bunch of different things, right? All of those things tend to go up when economy is doing well and go down otherwise. Now, what else do people need? And now that applies not just to individuals, but to pension funds, endowments, and so on. They want something that does not depend on markets going up. So you don't, you're not just completely held hostage to stock market performance. A lot of investors just kind of submit to that. They assume if stock market is down 20%, they're down 20%. I don't like submitting to this, uh, to this dynamics. So, but how do you get around this dynamics? Well, you want something that can overall make money over the long run, but at the same time, uh, be at least orthogonal to the stock market. Because if the global macro fund makes 10% a year, but it's totally correlated to stock market, it might be not adding that much value. But if you can make 10% a year, and and I'm just saying this number, not, not just kind of randomly, right? Well, yep. Choose your own percentage. If you make 10% a year, but you see zero correlation to stock market. That's actually a very valuable proposition to a lot of investors. So I always felt like, first of all, you want to do something uncorrelated. And furthermore, let's take it one step further. When you think about crisis environment, 
the macro funds like myself are supposed to, on average, perform well in this environment. Because if we don't have crisis environment, if you just have kind of regular world with things kind of a little up, a little down, but mostly chugging along, basically most people can muddle through with their stock portfolios without needing any hedge fund managers. I mean, how many hedge fund managers actually outperformed stock market between 2010 and 2020? Right? Very it's low. not easy. Yeah. Very, and I mean, you of course some did, but macro managers who bet on currencies and interest rates to beat stock market, given that really great bull market we had for so long, um, that is a very high bar. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is not to improve on stock portfolio. The purpose is improve on investors holding some portion of their money in cash. So it's kind of like they're holding in cash. I could hold it for them in cash, but with extra yield. I can find ways to make money in diverse environments if I'm successful, obviously, right? If I do what I'm planning to do. Um, so that's fascinating. Um, Sorry. I, so I have, I have a question in terms of when you going back to this period when you were buying the tips, you were also accumulating dividend futures. And I'm curious of why right. you chose to buy those as opposed to just buying the index itself. Well, dividend futures are kind of easier to trade in certain ways, especially in Europe. That's been an instrument that I liked for years. Uh, it often opens up great opportunities because it settles. Uh, stocks can go to the price of stocks. You don't know what's going to be the price of stocks. They can go up or they can go down for a variety of reasons. I don't know where stocks will be in two years, but dividend futures will settle to whatever dividends are paid on that year. You cannot rely on stocks being at any particular level on any particular year. While dividends, in the absence of complete arm market, don't typically get paid, they're much more stable than the futures market implies. Even during great financial crisis, dividend futures fell in Europe not as much as they were projected. Then during uh, European debt crisis, market forward dividend futures basically started to price the situation that all banks stop paying dividends, and insurance companies will cut their dividends. And that was obviously a very extreme scenario, and it was very easy to bet against that uh, in 2011, 2012. So that kind of turned me on to this type of bet. And then again, I looked as like, well, COVID, Shmovit, what are they going to, everybody's going to stop Paying dividends five years from now didn't make sense to me. And 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 I, I'm familiar with this market, and there's a lot of structured products, which in, it means that the banks often have to unload their dividend risk, and that's why far dated futures, dividend futures trade cheap. So there's almost an embedded carry, just like the CNH or owning the bonds, and uh, with this in a steep yield curve. Yes, definitely. So you get kind of a handicap. You start your game with handicap in your favor, if you wish. You start with a good cushion. And the rates were really ridiculous. Like dividend futures fell like 50% from the highest almost or in the near future. And like that type of dramatic cut in dividends by the top European companies just did not seem to be likely. And this is kind of situations, yes, you can be wrong, but the risk reward is so already rigged in your favor. That's right. You're you're working with an edge. Um, speaking of edges, uh, knowing um, some good wisdom is definitely up there in terms of what traders should should be aware of. And I love this quote that from your book. It says, "Back in my early days of trading, I heard a veteran tra trader say something like, the price goes from cheap to cheaper to really cheap to unbelievable value to get me out." Do you think we're experiencing yeah. that currently in the, in the stock market, for example, with the, let's just say, um, do, you, do you see that occurring right now in the tech stocks, in the ARC stocks? Uh, I think where my best guess would be when we're close to even the cheap level, let alone cheaper or anything like this. <laughs> I think it's very early. <laughs> I mean, there might be some individual stocks like I'm not an ex, like I'm not following like every peloton of the world. Yep. But uh, overall, I'm seeing Nasdaq off like, I don't know, what is it, off like 12% of the highs or something like this. This is hardly catastrophic. We still right. uh, had a huge run up last year. And by many people's standards, the stock market was high by the end of 2020. Not that I'm not saying that what, that's what I think the direction of the stock market will be down. But I'm seeing uh, if people think this is cheap, 
for overall market levels, they have something else coming. We're just in the first cheaper. Where we, it was cheap and it's now cheaper. We got to get to really cheap to unbelievable value and we to finally to get me out. So we still have three more stages. You know, Alex, one of the lines that I love to use um, in in this kind of in the same vein is that whenever someone tells me this is a two or three sigma de, de, or uh, sigma deviation move. And they say, oh, you got to get in there. It's two sigmas or three sigmas or even four sigmas. I always say, you know what the problem with four sigma moves are? They always go to eight before they go back. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes, that's one way to think about this. Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah. I love uh, in- – Kind of interspersed with the book is obviously a lot of game theory, the way you think, the strategic aspect of it. One of the quotes I, that I like to, uh, that I, I didn't really, I wasn't aware of, but now that when you say it out loud, it seems very obvious, but I love it that you actually talked about it being a game. It's the, I know that you know that I know game. Right. Could you explain that? Yes. It's a little bit, it's happening a lot with, uh, People often talk about this, for example, in a technical analysis. Uh, do you sometimes notice that recently it happens that some key asset breaks, some key level, right? And then everybody's like, "Now it's going to go up." No, you buy. No, you buy. <laughs> right? <laughs> and this kind of what happened to Bitcoin uh, earlier last year when Bitcoin reached like its highs, whatever, on the first run up in 2020, like. 60, 65,000, I forgot what exact highs. Then it had a severe correction, and then it had a rather short Bitcoin winter, and then it actually made new highs. It acted out new highs. And it was like, yeah, it's going to 100,000 now, 200,000. Who's the buyer? So everybody's like, well, it's supposed to go up because it broke the resistance level. <laughs> and like, well, everyone knows that it broke the resistance level. Everyone uh, who is studying short term is long, so who is the next buyer? So it's a little bit of those games happen. I think I did it also in the context of talking about the Fed. I know that, you know, that like the Fed knows, like when the crisis comes, we know that the Fed has to come and provide liquidity. And they know that we know that. Right. But there is nothing they can do about that because we're already positioned in a way that they cannot help by doing this. Otherwise, things will keep unraveling further. Uh, I have a question while we're on the Fed. A lot of people, especially on FinTwit, like to talk about how stupid they are, how they don't uh, they don't get it, and they're not that sophisticated. Do you do you hold that belief, or do you? Um, I've also heard the argument that they're actually very sophisticated. They the people on the New York Fed know exactly what's going on, and that they are are more aware of all the different games and all the different uh, things that are getting priced in than we might ever imagine. I probably closer to the latter camp right. uh, than a former camp, but with a caveat that I will explain. I think these are generally smart people, the accomplished people. It's not so easy to be invited on the Fed board. And they generally try to do the best they can. The idea that they somehow like corrupt or incompetent, I think it's completely unsubstantiated. And uh, I cannot vouch for anybody. I'm, I'm not been the insider, but it really seems to me that they're trying to do the best they can. And honestly, I'm not 100% sure that I would have done a better job uh, okay. in their spot at every juncture. Uh, a lot of stuff I would say, like, no, they shouldn't be doing this. I would really do this. But you know what? That's their opinion against mine. I think they went for this into this for public service, and these are smart people trying to do the best they can. What I think where I think the weakness comes in, which I think is uh, really hard to avoid, including myself being really aware of that. I'm still very hard to avoid it. Be, what I call it, like being caught in zeitgeist, like being caught in the, oh, everyone is saying this and this is a general field, so that's how it must be. Uh, okay. That I think is a very difficult thing to avoid, even for smartest people, because they have a team and they all talk about things and everybody talks around them and everybody asks them certain questions and they kind of get into this mentality. And this is what I think happened over the last few months. If you really, if if, if you don't mind if I segue in a more recent market, just to give an example. Sure, let's do it. Fed was very adamant in 2020 that they will be patient, that they will let inflation run and not raise rates till we know, till this 
post-COVID transition is over. You could have very easily disagreed with this. I'm not saying that that was correct or wrong, but that's the position they formulated. Now, they formulated this position before there was actually, they were actually in the middle of this post-COVID inflation, but they anticipated it. All of us anticipated this inflation shock. Maybe they didn't anticipate by their own admission the scope of supply shock, of supply bottlenecks, but that's really not anything to say about inflation being transitional or not transitional. If you have a supply shock, what does it have to do with the Fed and how is the Fed going to address uh, vessels being stuck in ports or trucks, like not having to deliver what they have to deliver? How is it going to be fixed with interest rates? Uh, so, And somehow over the end of last year, they changed their mentality and went into this very different feel of like, oh, we have to hike, we have to address inflation, while nothing actually changed. If anything, I would make a argument that we dodged the inflation bullet, that I was worried about inflation in 2020, but I'm not anymore. And yeah. I, I feel very strongly about that. But in the very least, you could not take my view, I could be wrong, but I, it's very, very hard for me to imagine that anything substantial changed in terms of policy directive relative to what we already knew in 2020 and relative to what they know now. However, they are either back then they were caught up in the zeitgeist of that time or now they're caught up in what's going on now. And also, in either case, I cannot reconcile those two thinking and being clear and consistent thinking. Okay, I, I, I understand that argument. And, and you're right that the, there's, still a, there's still some politics involved is what I might say on, on that because there was probably politics of them being lower for longer to try to fic, help people out. That was probably a little bit too easy because they were trying to assuage the the voters and help everyone out. And now that the the kind of tide has turned there a little bit too much, like we got to fix the inflation, which they're not going to fix. I'd love to kind of dig, though, into this idea that you think we've dodged the inflation bullet. And uh, just so um, you know, I completely agree that inflation is coming down and everyone that's sitting and looking at a 7% um, headline you know, that's the wrong number to look at. What we should really be looking at is the one year inflation swap, which is trading around three and a half percent. So first of all, I have a question for you. Do you think that that people understand that the inflation is going to come down no matter whether the Fed does anything or not? And then B, do you think that the inflation is going to come down enough that that inflation swap that's trading at three and a half percent is a good buy or should it be sold? I'll, I'll answer the second one because it's easy because that's a market question, not a okay. psychology question. Okay. <laughs> and I'm a trader, not a psychologist. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm ambiguous about where inflation swap should trade for one year because inflation swap is a technical thing. It reflects the headline CPI. Mm-hmm. And headline CPI is very strongly driven by energy prices and food prices. And right recently, we had a pretty substantial run up in oil, which gives an impulse to headline CPI. So whether you think inflation should be above or below certain levels in the next few months is very much about your opinion on oil and natural gas, more so than what you think about core structure of the economy. Okay. So that is a very important caveat. Okay. So, so do you want to – Because do of that, I'm ex- reluctant to say – yeah. Do, you want, do you want to extend it then to five years? Do you want to go out further? Like, let's let's say five years are trading what? Two and a half? I can't remember the inflation swap. Five years are two and a half. Is that a buy or a good buy or a sell? I don't think that bad in itself is the bet I would make in either direction. I think buying inflation index bonds is a better bet. Oh, yes. Because it's not a break-even bet. Not buy them against shorting. Shorting necessarily <laughs> so no- Alex, nominals, which is a break-even bet. Yeah, this is where you and I differ because <laughs> this is the the meat of our matter. Is that you always think that um, that you want to be long that carry, and I I'm worried about the entire uh, yield structure headed higher. Like I'm worried. I look at the terminal rate and I see what is it one and three quarters to two. I worry that a term that terminal rate is going to be. Uh, in for a big surprise and that we could be back to a terminal rate that's closer to three or four. Do you think I'm insane? Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't think it's a big three or four is not a lot because if I think the terminal rate is zero, 2% puts us somewhere in the middle and convexity works in my favor. 
That is, I make more money on price as it goes from 2% than zero than you make when it goes from 2% to 4%. My opinion is the terminal rate is zero for developed worlds. And that is, I feel like that has been proven in spades, that it's very hard to get off zero. And the current yield curve dynamics, if anything, supports that with not having any kind of meltdown on the long end. That was a very short term phenomena. And all we're having right now is like, Fed is like pushing on a string and the yield curve is inverting. And I, I, I kind of hate saying this because it just said so silly, but like that how inverted yield curves always predict recessions. Yeah. But they kind of do. And oh. I felt stupid for saying this. I even wrote a post about like how you can take this type of stuff with a grain of salt, but no, you it's, still have it's, to pay attention to those things. Uh, oh, 100%. It's, it's been one of the most uh, accurate predictors of uh, recessions going forward. Now, having said that, there was a time in 1981 and 1982 that Dr. Henry Kaufman and Solomon Brothers was a big predictor of inflation, and the bond market was the other way around. The bond market did not believe that inflation would ever be quelled. They thought that it was the certificates of confiscation. There was all sorts of bearishness, and what I worry about is that when we get the secular turn in interest rates, if we get one, that we're going to have too many people that are still leaning that way. And it'll be like Kaufman was, was bearish bonds for the next 20 years, even as, as bonds well, were it, the greatest, greatest investment ever. Well, you know what is interesting to me is that ever since, I think the chronic bearishness remained and it stayed all these 40 years on the bonds, hence those uh, ridiculously upward sloping yield curves. Is this why, again, longer dated bonds yield more than shorter dated bonds, while they have all the convexity, all the free convexity in them, and higher yield. That's a real money giveaway. Forget about what you think about markets. Just from perspective of pure game theory, you make much more money when bonds go up than you lose when you go down. So 2% yielding 30-year bonds are a giveaway in this environment. Okay. Well, and, like, and you know, just as a little aside, I see that this, um, it got me a little worried when they trotted out Henry Kaufman on the Bloomberg piece the other day. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> well, well it, look, it could very easily happen. And again, I'm thinking like you could be right or wrong either way. I'm just trying to skew the odds in my favor. And the odds have been really skewed in favor of bond market. And you could get a little worried. Of, like I was a little worried, honestly, in 2020, 2021. But now this worry passed because I think ah, nothing's going to happen. There is no fiat because what is really worry is like if you see like a broad fiat weakness if you saw precious metals like gold is going to ten thousand and things just kind of getting unglued maybe if dollar was if you wanted to specifically think about us if there was a very severe weakness in dollar but uh, we didn't get that precious metals are stable uh, what we see is basically supply-driven inflation, which we know will unwind just by definition because the supply bottlenecks have to unwind via higher supply. Uh, you see some uh, kind of uh, specific inflationary effects of post-COVID lockdowns. And if, when this all up unwinds, there seems to be virtually no path for inflation not to calm down. You also, for a while, you saw like, oh, it's all going to be taken by MMT. Now that seems to kind of died out. There is no MMT anymore. The fiscal impulse is turning negative. It really seems like there is no particular reason to. Uh, and the market is kind of beginning to confirm it by the curve responding to this kind of pushing on the front end by flattening. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I really see. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. The the market is... is uh... Uh, confirming your view about the fact that uh, it not not much has changed. So I'll, here's a question to put you on the spot: the the market believes that what we're going to get, how many hikes? It's one and three quarters, I think, before on the the euro dollar curve. So what's that? Seven hikes? Uh, do you think yeah. before they? Do you think they get to seven hikes, or do you think that the the well? The, I think the most likely amount, from my perspective, is one. One. So you think they hike once yeah, that's and what everything I think rolls? Is the most, well, they could. Yeah, I think maybe they get in one hike. They might not even get one hike, but it looks like they baked in the March hike. So I think they'll get it in. That so far my kind of projection: one hike for the cycle and no more in this decade. 
Okay, so I, I guess all that euro dollar strip uh, out for the next <laughs> the next two years is a great. Yeah, I buy. kind of like it. I kind of like it. Yeah, I think it's a good buy. However, having said that, even though I might have just tell you such a strong like. This is my view, kind of the central view, but there is a lot of distribution. What I think one is the most likely number, but it doesn't mean that two is unlikely. Do you see what I'm saying? Like if yep. I put distribution, for example, you ask me how many hikes over the next three years, and I say, well, zero, less than 5%, because very likely that they will hike, right? Yep. One, maybe like 10, 15% probability concentrates at one hike. Maybe like another five, per, maybe like 20% probability at one hike, say, for example, in my opinion. Then another five or 10% at two hikes, another five or 10% at three hikes, and so on. And it kind of spreads out and tails out, right, with lower, lower probability. I, originally, I thought, given on the language a year ago, I thought that uh, it would be more likely that we would go the whole 2022 without hikes and then kind of start a slow and more protracted hiking cycle. But now I see more and more evidence that we're entering into the late cycle environment and I'm thinking maybe one, maybe two, maybe none. None is unlikely. Something has to happen in the next few weeks, right? But uh, we're having all the... It's also... This is what's very important here. And sorry, I'm being a little wordy here, but I think it's an important point. I have to check myself for not having my mind being occluded the same way I've just uh, accused the Fed members to be occluded. Okay. Just because stock market had a bad week, it does not mean that the economy is rolling over. <laughs> That's true. So that makes me right. do one, one of the It's very easy to get in this mindset. <laughs> For it's sure. It's very easy to get this mindset. Oh, <laughs> well, everything that... is ungluing because Nasdaq is down another percent, right? Well, well that is my... Nothing pu- is ungluing yet. Yeah. yeah, that's my pushback about uh, about all these fellows that write op-eds telling the Fed what to do. I remember that Kevin Warch was writing an op-ed telling the, saying that the Fed was clueless. They were too low. They were too low. And then next thing I know, in 2018, uh, you know, Powell puts in a few hikes and then talks about we're a long way from neutral and Kevin Warsh is writing an op-ed that he's immediately got to cut it and if we put Wall Street f- folks in charge of the uh, Federal Reserve they would there would be so much volatility in the front end of the curve we wouldn't <laughs> we wouldn't know what was going on which brings me to one of your um, points though that in your book you say you have you a lot of people talk about strong opinions lightly held and then you say I prefer weak opinions strongly held could you explain that yes uh what I mean by that is that what I mean by weak opinions that entering a, you enter a trade fully realizing that this is a probabilistic statement. I slightly think that one thing is more likely to happen to another than I bet on that thing, but I could very easily turn out to be wrong. That's what I mean by weak opinion, as opposed to saying this has to go down because it broke this level or what, this resistance or this support lights out, it's all over. I don't like those statements. What I like is, oh, I think there's a 60% chance that we'll make money on this, right? Uh, so that's for me that uh, what I mean strongly held is that I feel that the best impact in terms of research you can do before you put the trade on, if you think everything through, you analyze all the factors you can analyze. You don't need to overanalyze, but whatever it is your strategy requires you, whatever inputs your strategy allows you to analyze, you analyze. And you decide this is your entry point, this is your exit, this is your stop, this is your profit level. You think through your strategy and it's better not to change it no matter what happens and actually ignore the new information, which is very counterintuitive. It's very kind of goes contrary to a lot of common market wisdom that says be nimble, take in new information, I think being nimble is counterproductive, at least for myself. I think the best thing to do is to treat the treat trade like a bullet from a gun. The trade is done. These are the levels. We'll hold it till it reaches the level. That, that's a And fa- that is what I mean by strongly held. Okay. That's a fascinating uh, analogy, the bullet from the gun. So talking a little bit more about uh, different uh, trader uh, kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it wisdom, I guess strategies or ways of, of, of kind of passing your your knowledge down. You talked about this point in the March euro dollars, and I'll just read the quote here. So I started to reverse my hedges and once again buy the March euro dollar contracts higher than I had sold them only days ago. The turnaround was not a mistake in itself. As I have discussed before, one shouldn't get hung up where one sold or bought something recently. 
one should always try to do the best forward-looking trades based on the current environment and current available information. So pressing risk when the tide rises in your favor is not only valid, but often necessary. So Alex, I, I you know, this is great advice. It, it's, it, it makes sense, but it's easier said than done. So how do you go about doing that? How do you forget so quickly the price you paid before? You don't. I'll tell you honestly, you don't. <laughs> it is. You try to, and it's always there in the back of your mind. <laughs> exactly. You don't. And one of the one of the objectives of my book, the reason why I did such detailed transcripts and such detailed conversations, I really wanted the readers who curious about what it's like to be a trader to feel this the psychological trepidations of a trader like what are you really going through and i really wanted to be very candid about the fact that despite being rather experienced by most people's standards as a trader i'm not immune to uh, various psychological tribulations i'm not immune to stress i'm not immune to regret i'm not immune to frustration when things go against me you just kind of learn to deal with this. It's, uh, I think you do have to have certain ability to leave things behind. If you don't, you probably uh, should not be a trader. Like if you the kind of person who gets really caught on shoot of wood of, yep. oh, I wish I've done it yesterday. I wish I've done it. If that is your personality, that you really get stuck on this, then it is possibly the wrong line of business because I can almost guarantee that you will have those experiences of shoot of woulda in your career. There's, you will never feel like I did everything at the right time, at the right spot, at the right price. Right. Uh, okay. So you will know that, you will suffer, but you have to be able, you ju it just has to be in your personality to be able to look past that. Right. Okay, so I have another question here. You said at one point the efficient markets theory breaks down in similar fashion to Newtonian mechanics. Can you explain what you mean by that? And and then also recognizing those periods, how important is that to your process? Well, recognizing market regimes is very important. And I think, uh, yes, the kind of understanding the regime, what markets are really broken. I even use this whole, like, to continue with Newtonian physics and various physics analogy. I used in my book a lot of black hole analogy about how the texture of the market itself is getting ruptured when you have a crisis. Um, yes, what I meant by that is that efficient market theory is really the idea that markets are full of rational people who buy and sell things because they choose to. And that's a very important thing. In some sense, both behavioral finance and efficient market theory, that's been my pet peeve for a long time. People argue um, psychological kind of crowd behavior, behavioral finance versus efficient market theory where everyone is a rational decision maker. I think both of those theories, in fact, are limited because they both make an assumption that people act voluntarily in the markets. They think it through well, for whatever reason, whether it's rationally or irrationally, but it makes an assumption that people have a choice. And in normal market, at least when it comes to something like active stock management, when people pick stocks, yes, you buy Apple because you like Apple better than IBM, or you buy Google because you like it better than Facebook, right? You make your choices. That is normal market environment. Same thing in uh, physics. Basically, if you use Newtonian mechanics to build bridges, to fly planes, to shoot guns, to, I don't know, whatever, play baseball, whatever it is that you do that involves moving objects, uh, it actually works because this is all normal environment. But you cannot use Newtonian mechanics to fly, to evaluate like the movement of stars over uh, in a distant ranges. You cannot understand like shape of the universe using Newtonian mechanics. And you even cannot really fly spaceships over the long run with purely Newtonian mechanics because things eventually get distorted at high speeds and large uh, distances or in large size scales. So in, you need to use Einstein's equations to get more precise analysis. Same thing with markets. When you sell 100 shares of some stock. You just look, this is the bid, this is the offer, who decided to buy it, who decided to sell it. You need to sell 100,000 shares. All of a sudden, the fact that there's 200 shares on the bid might not matter. Now, if the whole market is in crisis and there are billions of shares going through the market, being sold rapidly, regular decisions of individuals, ah, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy that, 
irrelevant. That's all gets swamped by people who have to sell because the boss told them to sell or they have a margin call or some other structural reason to sell. And the market just starts functioning in a very different way. And in that environment, thinking that uh, prices are established by individuals rationally thinking that that's where the price should be, that's purely ridiculous. And I think uh, proponents of efficient market theory kind of try to make those things as some kind of exception, but there's just way too many exceptions. Those realities of those swamped and disrupted markets, that's, as we talked earlier, you can make an entire career on taking advantage of those. It's not that they happen so often in given sector of the market, but first of all, they happen around the world here and there, those big market disruptions in various sectors, sectors and the scope of what happens is there so big that it could uh, overwhelm a decade of efficient market nonsense. I, I, Alex, I'm completely with you. This The idea that you can't, that the markets are efficient is just so preposterous. Like, first of all, who makes it efficient? Someone has to make it efficient. And I always tell the story of my best high school friend. He went off and he went to some fancy school in Europe. He went to NCAD. And afterwards, he, he got this job. He made some money and he wanted to make some trades. So he, he phoned me up and I told him about some ARB I was doing, some trade. And he said, no, wait. And he was all confused. And I said, what's, what's the problem? He says, but that can't exist. And I was like, what do you mean it can't exist? He says, this shouldn't exist. And I said, yeah, you're right. We're going to make it so it doesn't exist anymore. We're going to go and do the ARB and f- figure it out. But for him, it was just so foreign that, that that this existed in the market. And people don't realize that it's it's people like us that are trying to keep it in line. And then there's that whole other element of the when psychological crowds get out of, out of, out of hand. Now, I'm going to just segue into one more question I have before we get to some fun stuff. Um, one more question about the markets in the current environment. And, and um, is your background Russian? Am I, uh, uh, am I correct? Yes. 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 So I, I can't, you know, I have a, a Russian that specializes in the in the markets. I, I got to ask what you think about the Ukraine-Russia situation. And you can tell me both from a political point of view, but more importantly, from a market point of view, whether it's going to matter. Honestly, I'll be honest with you. I feel I have very little to add as far as expert opinion there. There is, uh, when understanding any particular region, there is, of course, a lot of like history of the region and history of tensions and uh, stories is always much more complex and they appear from outside. That's all I can say about it. That's basically true from that conflict as well as um, any other regional conflict. I think tensions are real. Somehow, my bias right now not to see this as a world-ending crisis like, I don't see this as a, this is not on the forefront of my mind. This, like, for example, if we just take the purely utilitarian point of view, forget about human tragedy for the moment. And as a trader, you won't have to forget about this and focus just on the portfolio impact. And if you told me what could be the next thing that the next really bad thing for overall risk in the world, I probably would not guess that it would be the crisis, Russian-Ukrainian crisis, and I could be very wrong because that could end up being that, because who would have guessed that in 98, Russian debt crisis would be the catalyst for a mini global financial crisis, right? Kind of a practice run for 2008 global financial crisis, right? So who knows what can, like, knock the dominoes? Uh, I, I don't see this as knocking the dominoes. Just that's my intuition. Okay, well that's but good. But I might end up eating. I might end up eating those words. Listen, you know, so, you know as as well as I do. Uh, like Stanley Druckenmiller talks about the fact that sixty percent of his uh, trades are, are winning trades. Sixty percent. That means forty percent are losers. And anybody that's in this yeah. game understands that we get things wrong all the time. So now let's get to some fun things um, in terms of this book. And as I mentioned, I liked it because I feel like I get to know you a little bit better. Even though this is our first time talking, I feel like uh, I, I know you, and uh, I got to ask, FogCon, <laughs> tell us about what it is, and because <laughs> uh, I'm confused. I even went and looked it up, and I'm still confused what it is, and what what, what attracted to you to it? Okay, well, uh, FogCon people would love for the free promotion. 
<laughs> it is a science fiction convention. There are many, there are many science fiction conventions all around the country, and it's one that happens in the Bay Area on an annual basis. I've gone to each of them since inception of this particular convention. Uh, we had skipped and we're skipping, I think, this year as well because of COVID in terms of having an in-person convention that they're holding some virtual events. So that's a quick summary. I'm a fan of fantasy and science fiction. I, I read a lot since I was young. I write as an amateur and I like going to conventions. You could uh, meet similar fans and meet with the authors. So this isn't and like talk the, about this isn't like you like. This, so this is literature, uh, like uh, writing, as opposed to the guys that get dressed up as Chewbacca and go to a, uh, like something like that. It's different than Comic Con. You know, this one, this one, people typically don't get dressed as Chewbacca. <laughs> there are science fiction conventions where people might dress up for an occasional event. Uh, like, for example, if you go to World Science Fiction Convention, you will see some, which is a huge event and has like. Uh, awards that are given, which might be like similar to Oscars events, but you'll see like at certain events, so people in, in interesting suits and stuff will be demonstrated. But this is more of a literary stuff, so it's more like people interested in writing and reading. So that would be the angle. You don't see. I don't dress up. If that okay. is the actual question. Do I dress up like Shivaka? No, I don't. <laughs> so I often ask people for their favorite investment book, and that seems a little boring, and we know now it's the Trades of March 2020 is our favorite investment book. But let's ask you instead, what is your favorite science fiction book? And maybe pick something that is not, don't pick Dune or something that's going to everyone know. Maybe something a little off the beaten track. That, that would be exposing people that are interested in this that uh, you feel is just a, a must read? Am I allowed to pick Ender's Game or is it too common to... Oh, okay. Well, the, the, no, you pick Ender's Game. That's that's fairly common, but... Uh... No, Ender's Game is like a little well-known. I think uh, I would probably, if I had to step out of something which is a little less known for um, people outside the genre, but people who actually like to read good literature, I would recommend Hyperion by Dan Simmons. Okay, there we Not go. Not to be confused with Hyperion by John Keats, but it is inspired by it, which is the original poem, famous poem, Hyperion, and there was a novel called Hyperion, inspired by it by Dan Simmons. Well, there we go. We got so, the we got the science fiction. If uh, you want, this is very this is extremely literary science fiction. Okay. This is a, I believe one of the greatest works of literature ever written. Oh, well, there you it, go. That's... It could compete with all the other great works of literature. While Ender's Game is probably one of the most, possibly the most classic, like pure science fiction novels ever. And of course, there is a Lord of the Rings. If you go into fantasy world, that's oh, there is yeah. no competition there. Exactly. How can you know? Those are terrific books. Um, okay, so now let's go to the next fun thing that I've written down here. This you is this true, Alex? That you met a psychic who told you that the bottom would be on March 23rd. And then if it's true, why weren't you long? (laughs) Well, I was buying the market throughout those days, but it is, it is, it is pretty funny. I mean, it's like, it's so funny because she actually remembered this conversation. I remember the situation when we had this conversation, uh, we remembered, um, we remember. I remember how it went. Uh, so I know uh, for sure we that kind that, of like she's like she's like stock market was already tanking, but it was still February because it was before lockdown. I was still seeing people in person, but stock market started to go down. And she says like I feel that the bottom will be on March twenty third. That was about four weeks in advance. Well, I think that she's really an option trader, and that she realized that that was an opex expiry, and that's when we bought them. I believe. So maybe that's it. Listen, Alex, it's been well, a real it's been a real pleasure having you on our show. Why don't you tell people about the book, where they can find it, give uh, give everyone the spiel. Okay, so yes, it's the Trades of March 2020. We mentioned it several times. It could be found on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the regular venues. Now, I really hope that people will buy the paperback because the way the paperback came out, the graphics and like the colors, it's just really amazing. It was beyond all my expectations, the way the book looks. And if you really want to look at like all the snapshots and the charts and really get the feel for it, having a physical copy is uh, the best way to, to go. Um, so, yeah, this uh, available everywhere. Please read. Please leave reviews. Yes, and, and I, I appreciate I, everybody's support. Yeah, uh, I I can say, Alex, that I um, it doesn't the the 
there is a lot of graphs and there is a lot of, as we've explained, candid uh, conversations between you and your traders. Uh, and that would, it, it doesn't come through on the Kindle as well as it does in the physical book. So make sure you go and get the physical book because you'll appreciate that. Uh, Alex, I, it's been a real honor having you on. I've been looking forward to this for a whole long time, but even more importantly, congratulations on the great book. Hopefully it's the next alchemy of finance and uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you very much. I'll have a great weekend. Take care. Hey guys, this is uh, Harris Kupperman. You all know me as Cuppy. Uh, we're going to be doing an interview with a very good friend of mine, Mark Moss. He's a nationally syndicated radio host. Uh, he's a YouTube celebrity. Uh, he's a good friend of mine from Market Disruptors, Mark Moss. Uh, super excited to have him on the show. I've actually known him for the better part of a year because he's my next door neighbor down in Rincon. Um, Today, we're going to talk about something that I think is really interesting. Um, when I first started investing, the secret to making a lot of money was buying a company that was growing fast for less than five times earnings. It was just that easy. But the game has changed. I find that lately, I watch the news, watch a politician screw something up, and then basically use cause and effect with a couple month lag to make a lot of money. And increasingly, as politics you know, drives economic decision making and drives the macro, all you have to do is watch the politicians screw it all up. And Mark and I have spent many a late night discussing all the stupidity coming from our government and many other governments and how to make money out of it. And so I thought it would just be great if we uh, chatted this all over. So, Mark, uh, super excited to have you on. Hey, thanks, Cuppy. That was a that was a great intro. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to get here and talk to you about this. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, it's... We've we've had, as you said, many late nights having conversations, which uh, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed, and uh, you know, poking fun, laughing, commenting <laughs> about you know, like you said, the stupidity of things going around in the world today, and it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've loved having talks with you because we can talk about it from that angle, and it's interesting. You know, most people, or I, I don't know about most people, but a lot of people that I hear from, and I hear from a lot, I get probably. 5,000 comments a week across all my platforms. And um, a lot of times they just, they don't want to hear anything about politics. And uh, a lot of times people will leave me comments like, ah, stay in your lane or something stupid like that. <laughs> and it's like, you can't understand what's going on in the financial world if you don't understand what's going on in the political world. And uh, it just, it just, it amazes me. Yeah. And I mean, it's so true. Cause I mean, what's happening in the political world is driving the economic cycle. I mean, the Federal Reserve is obviously the big dog there, but all of the other policy decisions, all the stimulus, all the, you know, very basic, you know, lobbyists wants a stimulus. They get a stimulus for one for their little industry. Well, that helps their industry, but someone else suffers. It's, it's kind of zero sum in a way. And, well, and if you think it's the Fed is the big dog and not related to politics, I think <laughs> that's that's uh, missing it as well. I mean, it's all it's all politics at this point, right? Um, and so the Fed is kind of bending at the will of of the government and society and and whatever it is. And so, yeah, I mean, you look at that, and then and then it's even it's even bigger than politics now because you know we're kind of at a point where the the governments of the world are being usurped by you know bigger think tanks right so the WF the WHO etc um, and and then even you know IMF and BIS levels and so um, I, I look at the, all of that as politics um, I I, I kind of think about it and, and obviously I'm sure you do as well as a macro guy the the quote is is uh is used too much but it, it just it just fits right it's you know the, the great Wayne Gretzky said right skate to where the puck is going to be. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, I know it's used all the time and it's you know so cliche, but I mean, it's just true, right? I mean, you look at uh, the Fed or, or any politician or um, Wall Street or whatever think tank making these policies, and it's pretty easy to understand where things are going based off of that. Right. I mean, I think the one that we've joked around about the most is energy, because I mean, the reason we even have a civilization these days is because we figured out how to harness energy. It's, it's come a long way from chopping down a tree and using it to burn your mastodon, you know, like um, and, and energy is so political. And you have, you know, at, at the you know, smaller level, you know, the Saudis have something, the OPEC has something, the Russians have something. But then at a bigger level, the WEF just hates energy, you know. And so you have all these, you know, factors kind of playing off each other. And it's, it's going to drive energy policy, which is going to drive almost everything else in the economic cycle. 
Yeah, I mean, that's such a good point. And I know, obviously, that's been a huge focus of yours and in, in what you do. Um, and so I've loved getting your uh, insights into that. But I mean, just yeah, from a from a macro lens, if you zoom out to to the point that you've made, we have these big think takes, you know, the WF, World Economic Forum, if you will, but not just them. I mean, they're they're pushing policy down to, um, you know, the I don't want to say the local level, but it's like a country level. Um, I mean, if I if if I look at things um, from a hierarchy standpoint, it seems like the world has been taken over by the bankers and I'd probably put the BIS up on top of that. And then below that, you know, then, I, then these think tanks I'm referring to the world economic forum, the world health organization, like the policymakers. And then they kind of push it down a level below that to like the, the governments, which are kind of these enforcers. And so you've seen, you know, all pretty much all the nations in the world, you know, the U S the Europeans, et cetera, um, all get together and agree with the world economic forum that, Energy is bad. <laughs> and um, these guys are crazy because, you know, it. it's like they're not for human flourishment. And so humans have flourished because we've harnessed energy. And the world, you know, they want to go take the world back to this um, – raw natural place but unfortunately the world isn't hospitable in that raw natural place and people freeze to death and die of heat and we have floods and famines etc and it's only through harnessing the energy that we've been able to make the world hospitable and, and have human flourishment um, no more Why floods you- no more famines or or, or little anyway um, but yeah for the last 10 years they've been attacking it saying they want to shut it down so what do you think happens right we have less well, investment into those spaces and uh and now we're now we're paying the price for that so taking it a step back, why do you think it is that these organizations are so against energy? I mean, they, they claim it's about carbon, but it's never about carbon. It's always about power and control. I mean, what do you think that their real motive is here? Because if you yeah, know so the motive, you can make the money. Well, you know, um, knowing what's in a man's heart is always difficult. And so, you know, looking at what their actions are, I think, is, is probably more realistic. Um, you know, are these people evil? Are they incompetent? Um, doesn't really matter. They're doing what they're doing kind of a thing. But um, what I would say, though, to try to get some perspective on that is I think you just really have to zoom out, right? The further that you keep zooming out, a lot of times the more clear the picture can become. And so if you zoom out, I think it's um, really I need to go back to like a 250 year zoom um, to see. And the world basically shifts from it's like a pendulum swinging um, from centralization to decentralization. And so um, what happens is as the world continues centralizing, the powers that be continue to try to amass more and more power. But the problem is as that pendulum starts to shift, well, the, the problem is all that power corrupts. It becomes difficult to to live under. Um, and then the world is going to start, the pendulum will start swinging back and they're going to do everything they can to try to hang on to it. So um, why are they against it? In my opinion, I guess the, the quick answer would be control. Um, how do you take control of the entire world? And you can do that through energy, right? Uh, was it, uh, who was it? Uh, anyway, I'm drawing a blank on the name. It was, uh, not Winston Churchill, one of those guys, but they said, you know, um, control the, control the food, control the people, uh, control the money, control the region, control the energy, control the world or something like that. So like those are the three things they want to control, food, money, and energy. And so uh, you control the energy, control the world. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, it looks like the next crisis after energy is going to be food. I mean, people don't realize it, but uh, food is really just uh, energy. You know, everything that goes into wheat and corn, I mean, food is energy, energy is food. You know, it's kind of funny that it goes full cycle now and you have all this biodiesel and bioethanol, but you still need, uh, you know, nitrogen to produce any of this stuff. It's all very circular. And if you screw up the energy, you're going to screw up the food. I mean, do you think they're trying to create a famine or is it just accidental? uh, You know, back to the are they evil or are they ignorant? And I, I think in this case, they're more ignorant. And I think if we just go back one second back to kind of why are they doing this, um, Oh yeah, it's a uh, Henry Kissinger said that quote. Um, sorry, I knew it was someone like that. <laughs> um, but going back for a second, just to kind of why, um, I think you know one of the things is that a, um, a big thesis that I've had is that there's three revolutionary cycles that happen on different time frames, um, and they're all converging right now. So even though they're on different time frames, they're converging right now. So we have like this eighty year financial revolution cycle. We have like a 50-year technological revolution cycle, and we have a 
250 year political revolution cycle. And so I think if you look at all three of those, and of course, as an investor, you're looking for indicators, you're not looking for a single indicator, you're looking for multiple indicators that can try to give you a better picture. And I think if you're only looking at one of them, then sometimes it's hard to understand. And so we can see that the financial system is ready to be reset. Um, the Fed, you know, the central banks are stuck. If they keep printing, the inflation keeps going sky high. If they stop, if they stop printing, the, the markets crash. Um, we can see that, uh, you know, interest rates are at zero or negative. Uh, debt is all time highs. Um, and not just that. I mean, the IMF literally called for a Bretton Woods two moment. That was their words. And so what was Bretton Woods one? It was when the whole world reset onto a, onto a new currency, a global currency. The gold standard. And so uh, the, obviously the World Economic Forum is calling for a great reset. And so we can see that. And then how do you manage that great reset, right? Um, how, how do you manage that in a way that it turns out the way that you want it to turn out as opposed to the way that, that uh, maybe it would just break down? So I think they're trying to manage that and they're trying to control that. At the same time, we have this 250-year political revolution cycle where every 250 years, we have this revolution. So 250 years ago was the um, American Revolution. Obviously, the French Revolution happened. 250 years before that was the Protestant Reformation, which is a, was another political revolution. And so at those times, you have the people who are um, living under this mass centralization, mass globalization, and they're pushing back on that, rejecting that centralization and moving towards decentralization. So in the American Revolution, they rejected the monarchy of the government, and they set up a decentralized government, a, a, a republic. And so I think you have that, this, this political revolution cycle. So we're at this point where this peak globalization, and they're just squeezing, 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 and they're trying to manage this at the same time under this financial revolution cycle at the same time. And so um, they're trying to control that whole thing, in my opinion, and it's like almost like this controlled demolition. Um, and if they can control all of those things, I think then they think they can control it, I guess. Yeah, but it, it, it seems like it's extra brittle. Like by trying to control it, you almost break it in a way because it's just going to upset all the people. I mean, in the they end, you have, they have to break it. their day pretty happy if, you know, a gallon of gasoline is, you know, affordable and you can fill up your car and you go to the Walmart and food's cheap. And you make it very brittle if, you know, oil goes to 500 a barrel. And so it, it seems kind of counterintuitive if they want to stay in power and kind of control the ant hive. Yeah, but but uh, the problem is they've, you know, passed the Rubicon or whatever, right? They've, uh, they're Icarus with their wax wings. They've flown too close to the sun. I think at this point, you know, there's no, there's no return. And so you're right. Like it, you would think like from a political standpoint, if they would just back off, like, I mean, over the, over the weekend, I've seen all these videos across Europe of just massive protests. There's massive like, protests everywhere. Massive protests. And you would think like if they could just back off of these policies back to where they were even six months ago <laughs> or, or 12 months ago, they could probably stay where they're at, like stay in power a little bit longer, as you said, right? If they could just keep the prices down, right? Uh, the problem is they can't, right? It's just it's just gone too far. I mean, how would they keep energy prices down? Um, well, the let's talk about energy prices. I mean, we, we, we saw today, well, this week, that uh, Germany is going to be closing more nuclear power plants. I mean, Europe has an energy crisis. It's the yeah. middle of winter, you know? Uh, energy prices are crazy. And nuclear is the most reliable base load, uh, especially because as – the, the rest of the Europeans are learning. It's not always sunny and it's not always windy. And, you know, they already have a very brittle uh, electric grid and they're going to make it worse. Why do you think in the middle of an energy crisis, they choose now to close the nuclear power plants? I mean, it just it's one of these things that I'm not in Europe. I just kind of look at it and I shake my head. I don't get it. Like, why? Man, I, I, I think it's just incompetence, man. I think I think we have people that are living so far away from reality that they can't comprehend what the actions are uh, or the, you know, the consequences of their own actions are. And um, this kind of goes back to a, a great book, The Fourth Turning. And it talks about these 80-year cycles and it's, uh, it's generational theory. So hard times create 
strong men. So think about Germany. I mean, if we're talking about Germany for a second, think about Germany um, in uh, about 80 years ago, right? So it's an 80 year cycle. About 80 years ago, they're coming out of you know the Weimar inflation, hyperinflation period. Um, and literally they had to rebuild their country from rubble with their bare hands. It was amazingly hard times, but it created really strong men. And then those strong men create great times. And so then Germany saw massive economic prosperity. And as a matter of fact, Germany became the economic powerhouse of the EU, right? So hard times create strong men, strong men create great times. Great times create weak men. And so the, um, Germany saw so much um, great times. They saw so much prosperity. They were able to carry kind of the, econ the, the EU, but it created weak men. And then the fourth turning, the final one, is those weak men create bad times. And if you think about it, what happens is you have people now um, in office in Germany who are, have never produced, right? They're living off the production. They're consuming off the production of like two generations before them. So they've never lived in the real world. Um, and there's no... Um, you know, all the politicians for that matter, they don't have any feedback, right? Uh, no matter how bad of a job they do, they continue to get promoted, they continue to get more money. And so uh, you and I, we make those bad decisions, we lose everything, but they don't. And so I think it's, 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 uh, you know, incompetence, in my opinion, and they just don't see the, they don't see this. And I think, you know, some of it is they want to continue to control the energy, so they need to continue to, um, push that down. But I think a lot of the leaders, they're just incompetent. They don't realize how, how bad it is. I don't know. That's my opinion. I mean, when I think back in politics and I'm not that old, but I've always thought politicians are kind of, especially in a democracy, they're the sort of people that can see which way the mob is going and kind of get out in front and lead the mob, you know? And so, you know, they, they, they use polling, but they, they have like an innate sense of which direction the mob is going. And for some reason, politicians right now, and I think there's a, a, just a generation of politicians that are quite old. I mean, Merkel, Biden, like these guys have been around forever and they, ha they don't have new ideas. They haven't, I mean, they haven't really had to think for a decade or two. I mean, well, Biden can't think. Um, but you know, <laughs> they're not out in front leading the mob. The mob's kind of leading them and they keep pushing back on the mob, which I think is why, you know, in, in Europe, you see these guys out in the streets, you know, in France, they've been doing this for like five years now. Like, and you know, they all have different things they're pissed about. Um, but a lot of it is just government interfering in their life and making everything expensive. Whether it's you know in France where they're you know crazy taxes and regulation, or you know some of the other rest of Europe, you know it's COVID policy which makes no sense. You know, you see these people just all upset about various different things, and you know it, it, it's easy to tie it together to yeah, you know, inflation is there and it, it's it's taking the middle class and shredding them but i think it's bigger than that it, it's like you said this just sheer incompetence and the leadership is totally out of touch because they go to the wef and you know the wef tells them they're doing a great job and they don't have to really think about the voters anymore yeah i mean like i said i i go back and forth between the evil or incompetent and and i think it's just a mixture of both but to your point um you know, like, like, or the point I guess I made, these leaders are old and uh, they're out of touch. And um, I think they want to push these, I think, to control the people. I mean, that, that's just my opinion. I don't see any other reason why they would shut down energy. I mean, I guess they've been building this climate change narrative for so long. I mean, you started out saying it was you, not me, <laughs> uh, but talked about the uh, carbon emission uh, piece of it, which I think is is somewhere that we need to go back to. But um I think all these people, I mean, they're teaching kids from kindergarten these days that carbon emission is bad and it's going to destroy the world and the polar bears are going to die if we don't do something. And so um, there's that. But I think also back to where I said, which is this controlled demolition, is that um, they're at the end of this this cycle and um, they're trying they, – they, I don't know. They want to take control of the economy. The only way to take control of the economy is through the energy, I guess. That's my opinion. I, I don't I don't know. It's it's hard for me to guess what's in a man's heart. Right. I, I, it might just really be incompetence. <laughs> um, so now that we've kind of framed this, um, like, how do you uh, make money out of this? You know, um, it, it's going to really be awful if, if a German bunch of Germans freeze. But I just want to make money. That's that's my job. I have clients and I'm supposed to put up good numbers. I mean, what are the trades and the themes you really like the most? Well, I think the, the 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 trade on that and the big theme is obviously uh, government incompetence. <laughs> That's the trade, <laughs> um, and I think what that looks like is is uh, more inflation, right? Um, 
I think the the Fed is stuck. The central banks are stuck where they're going to have to continue print. And while they they signal they want to stop printing, the problem is that their policies are just making things worse. And so um, in the energy that we're talking about specifically, um, I think you've nailed it, obviously. And I've been kind of drafting off of what you're talking about, which I think the nuclear, the the uranium trade is is one for you know the decade probably i think uh we've seen as you said the Ger- the german german opposition uh continues to or the german opposition to what the eu is trying to do trying to make nuclear green energy which is a big shift but they're still trying to fight it they're still trying to decommission more of the nuclear power plants uh, but then we have you know now this narrative has started shifting over the last year and france is trying to push you know green energy forward I think it wins. I think uh, nuclear wins. I think it's the only way possible. And I think that goes back to just kind of thinking about the situation. Um, They're going to continue to try to shut down fossil fuels. They're going to continue to try to push what they call green or renewable energy. Um, As you kind of started out earlier saying that uh, wind is not always reliable. As a matter of fact, that's what they blame. Some of the shortage on is that they had a very low wind year. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in, uh, in England, which is which is funny. Imagine that. Um, and so we know that the uh, the renewables, or uh, as I like to call them, unreliables, aren't going to work. Um, they're going to shut down oil and gas. We're going to continue to have demand for that. And so it seems like nuclear is the only option. And as we're starting to see that narrative shift, like I said, um, starting to label them as green energy. Um, you know, the EU already drafted a recommendation to include nuclear energy and even natural gas um, to, to qualify investments as green energy. I think through 2045 it was for nuclear and like 2030 for natural gas. And so we're seeing that narrative shift. I believe that's going to be a big trend uh, back to the the Gretzky quote, you know, skates where the puck is going to be. I think that's where the money is going to come into. Um, you've done an amazing job playing on it. And I think that's a continued way to play it. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm I'm a big bull in uranium. In the end, uh, I don't think there's going to be enough of it versus where the demand's going to be a few years out. And never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that my portfolio would suddenly become ESG compliant in Europe. <laughs> well, I don't know is it, is it, if it's quite ESG compliant yet, but <laughs> um, they're trying, right? So, I mean, what are some other themes uh, you like right now? Um, I, I know you're a big, big book. Bitcoin bull. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Patrick and Kevin never chat Bitcoin. Uh, I think they actually call it the the product they can't talk about. So since uh, I guess uh, I'm doing the interview <laughs> here, let's, let's talk real quick. Uh, you know, what do you see and why? Yeah. So, I mean, again, right um, back to the big macro picture, um, we see all the nations of the world are trying to kind of race to the bottom. They're all kind of trying to compete to destroy their currencies as fast as they can. Um I know the inflation and deflation debate is very nuanced and it gets very academic. I just recently uh, was with Patrick at a George Gammon's conference in Houston last weekend. And we had a bunch of these academics there talking about inflation and deflation. And um, uh, Professor Richard Werner was there. I mean, he's amazingly smart, smarter than I could ever imagine being. Um, Lynn Alden was there. Um we, we had a bunch of smart people and this inflation deflation bait gets very uh, nuanced and difficult. And I just broke it down to look, the Austrian definition of inflation is it's the money supply that inflates, um, right? It's the volume of the money inflates. Prices don't increase in volume. Um, and so it's, in, it's, that's what drives it. <clears throat> and all the governments are basically stuck trying to increase their money supply. So that leads to more inflation and it's, it's nuanced. Some areas have deflation, some have some inflation, but I think, um, the trade there, the trend is that fiat currencies, all fiat currencies will continue to lose value against real assets. So another one of our friends, Brent Johnson, of course, he has the dollar milkshake theory, and he c- continues to talk about how the dollar will suck all the liquidity out of the world, you know, out of all the other currencies. And um, I, th- I think he's right, but so what? <laughs> so what? So what if the dollar gets stronger against every other currency out there? What I care about is what does it purchase me in goods and services? And so I don't care if it gets stronger than other currencies. I care, does it get stronger or weaker against the stuff I need to live, houses, food, energy, um, et cetera? And so the answer to that is we can see that the U.S. dollar and all fiat currencies have been losing value against real things. And so how do you play that, right? That's a, how do you, how do you play that trend? And I believe it's to get out of fiat currency. Um, obviously gold has been that trend for the last, whatever, it's been money for 5,000 years, you know, since the Fed's been around the last hundred years. 
Um, but what we've seen is that Bitcoin has taken that thunder, at least from the retail crowd, and has started taking that money that would typically go into gold from the retail trade. And the reason why is as the Fed and as the central banks continue to print an unlimited amount of fake fiat counterfeit money, people are going to want to buy real hard, tangible, well, real hard things. And when I say hard, I mean things that can't be created out of thin air. And so gold can't be created out of thin air. Uh, commodities can't be created out of thin air. And Bitcoin cannot be created uh, past, you know, it's, it's a limited supply. So I think Bitcoin is, is, um, is that way to play the Fed or all the, all the fiat currencies crashing? It's, uh, it's, it's an interesting thought, you know, because gold has always kind of carried that role. I mean, why do you think Bitcoin versus gold? Well, the problem with gold is that it didn't keep up. So gold has um, problems. So money has to be portable, divisible, durable, saleable, et cetera. One of those being portable. And so gold didn't work as the world expanded. So it was really good when you were my neighbor and I could pay you in gold. But when the U.S. wanted to send gold to Spain, they had to sail it across the sea and then they would sink the ships and pirates would take it, et cetera. And so because of that, it didn't work back then. We had to put it into banks and use ledgers. And the problem is that gold requires centralization. And when you have centralization, you always get manipulation. And so when the gold went in the banks, the banks started creating these these uh, layer two technologies called paper gold certificates. <laughs> and then the <laughs> bank started making more paper gold certificates than they actually had gold in the bank. And so that manipulation happened, which of course happened, um, led to 1933 to the, you know, the government seizing all the gold in uh, Act 6102. Um, revaluing it, uh, stealing all the value from the people. 1944 went on to gold standard, but by 1971, again, same thing, had printed way too many of these paper gold certificates, um, and they had to just get off the gold standard completely. So that's why gold can't work. Um, it requires trust. It requires some central administrator. And so we need an asset that nobody can, can control. I think that's the key piece that nobody can control. Nobody can create more of, and it works with the internet. You and I are in different parts of the world right now. I can't send you gold, but I could send you Bitcoin. Why do you think it ends up being Bitcoin that wins out as opposed to any of the other cryptocurrencies? I mean, why aren't we going to be trading in dog coins or, you know, puppy coin or I don't know, there's thousands of these things. Why is it Bitcoin? Well, I think the same thing would be said. Why, why gold instead of aluminum or ra rhodium or um, you know, platinum or whatever, right? It was the properties of what gold had and the scarcity that made gold the choice as opposed to any other metal. And so I would say the same thing about Bitcoin. It's the properties that Bitcoin has that make it um, unique from the other, whatever, 15,000 other coins that are out there. And so if you look at the problems, solutions are supposed to come to problems. So the problems are that we have this centralization. We have these central banks that um, centrally decide by themselves if they want to increase the money supply and create inflation or decrease the money supply like they do want right now and it causes deflation. And so you have these central players that control that. Um, and then, um, you know, they arbitrarily change the rules and then they could, you know, take it from us anytime they want. If I want to send it to you, they could say, no, you can't send money to Cuppy. They could stop it, block it, prevent it. And so what we want is we want something that's decentralized that nobody can control. We want something that's censorship resistant. So if I want to stop it, nobody can you know, stop that. If I, if I want to send it, nobody can stop it. And we also want something that's immutable. We can't have the rules be changing on us. And so that's what we have with the Federal Reserve System. They change the rules all the time. And that's what we have with other cryptocurrencies. And so like Ethereum is the, is the second biggest one and it's a perfect example bitcoin has a fixed supply 21 million there can never be any more it's immutable there's no way to change the code there's nobody at the head there's no leader there's no one that can change it and one of the big comparisons of bitcoin to ethereum is that um, bitcoin has a fixed supply 21 million what's the supply of uh, ethereum now as an investor if you think about this if you were going to buy a stock um, you look at the market cap, which is the <laughs> supply of the, the the stock times the price, right? So you have the the you have that. But if you don't know what the cap, or if you don't know what the supply of an asset is, like we know Bitcoin has twenty one million, it's a fully diluted supply. But what's the supply of Ethereum? We don't know. How many will there be? We don't know. Well, that was a big gripe. And so about five months ago, the the leader of of uh, Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, got together with some buddies. Uh, and they changed the rules. And they said, okay, we fixed it. Now we have a predictable um, inflation supply for Ethereum. 
But that sounds a lot like what the Federal Reserve is. We don't <laughs> want anybody to be able to change things. We want it to be fixed and immutable. And so most of all these other cryptocurrencies you hear, they have this like decentralized governance. And so in my opinion, that's the problem. We don't want governance. That makes sense. And you know, obviously, uh, Bitcoin has the scale um, that, I mean, as you know, I own a couple of Monero and we've debated yeah. this many times. Sure. Um, in your mind, what makes Monero so much inferior to Bitcoin? I mean, you, you get the anonymity, which is valuable in my mind, but you, you definitely have some trade-offs. Yeah, and, and that's the problem is the trade-offs. And so what happens is if you look at technologies, technology scales in layers. And so a good way to look at this is the internet. And so we have the the transfer protocol, the TCP, and then the IP address. So it's like TCP IP is, is a protocol. It's not a company. It's not a currency. All it is is a protocol that the internet uses to transfer packets of data, which you and I are using right this minute to transfer these packets of data. Um, and then when you wanted additional features, you would build on top of it. So you want email, great, SMTP on top. You want uh, security on websites, great, HTTPS on top. Um, and so while the internet is the TCP IP is a transfer protocol, Bitcoin is a value transfer protocol. It, all it is is a protocol. It's just a piece of code that transfers value in packets around the internet. That's all Bitcoin is. And because of that, it allows me to build unlimited options on top of it. Just like the internet, we have, you know, whatever, probably trillions of websites. And I have like my personal website, we have Facebook, we have Google, they're all different, but they all use the same TCP IP protocol. Now, does that make me a TCP IP protocol maximalist? <laughs> It kind of does, right? All, all we need is one protocol, and then we can have thousands or billions of uh, applications on top of it. And so now we have a value transfer protocol. And what happens is, back to your question on Monero, what, what, what the other 15,000 cryptocurrencies have done is they've tried to solve every problem at the protocol level. But that's not how technology works. That's not how the internet works, right? We, we, as we add applications on top of the protocol, we can make that, pro that application do whatever we want. And so um, if you want to get more privacy, you're going to have to give up something else, right? There's a trade-off right. there. And so what happens is um, you could use Bitcoin, which maybe isn't quite as private, but it's more decentralized, it's more secure, it's more immutable. Um, and then on the second layer, I could trade off a little bit of uh, security for more privacy. And that's exactly what Monero did, but they did it on the base layer. And so the downsides to Monero would be one, because it is private, I have to trust them that they haven't made more Monero than they told me they did. So with Bitcoin, it's open. And so I can see how many Bitcoin are on the network at any given time. I, I don't have to trust anybody. And that's the whole point. It's trustless. But Monero, I have to trust. I don't know. Did they make any more? I don't know. Right. And so <laughs> I, I would say that's probably the, the biggest trade off that they have. Um, and, and I would rather just make that. So now using layer two on Bitcoin, uh, an application built on Bitcoin, I can trade Bitcoin as private as I could trade Monero. Right, right. No, I mean, that, that all makes sense. And, you know, we'll probably debate this for the end of time. Um, you know, I, well, the other, and the other the other thing I would say about that real fast, Cuppy, is remember the attributes of what money is. And so um, Bitcoin is more than just money, but it's one application of it today. That's probably, like, like when the Internet came out um, in the late 90s, the, the killer application for the Internet was email. Right now, the Internet's way more than email today. But at the time, I'm sure you remember, right, it was email was the killer application. And so money is the killer application for Bitcoin today. But we'll see many other applications. We already are. So I'm, I'm, I'm invested in a company that has built a kind of a social media platform on top of Bitcoin. It's about the same. It's called Zion. It's about the same functions as Telegram. Where, uh, But all the communication, instead of going through Telegram servers, it literally goes across the Bitcoin network peer to peer. But anyway, just back to money real quick. It must be portable, divisible, um, durable, and saleable. So that means that uh, money was emergent. So in the beginning, we had barter. If you didn't want what I had, there was no deal to be made. And so it's like, well, you don't want my cow. How about would you take this thing instead? So now we have this medium of exchange. And eventually we got common medium of exchange. And then eventually one medium exchange emerged, which was gold. And it was the most widely recognized. And so that saleable is a big piece. And so um, I can go anywhere in the world right now and find someone that will take my Bitcoin. But I can't go in, uh, but, but the chance of them taking a dog coin or Monero or XYZ <laughs> coin is very slow. And so again, right, money is emergent. Um, and I think that's one of the key attributes. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't disagree with you. I intend to, at some point in my life, uh, own Bitcoin again. I, I had a good exit uh, early summer of uh, 2021. And I, I do want to own some Bitcoin. I think it's uh, something that everyone should own a few, just like I own some Kruger ends. Um, the big, the big, the bigger play here, I think. Again, is if we zoom out and we can just, we could just table Bitcoin, the Bitcoin argument for a minute. I think the bigger play is if we zoom out, as I said, and kind of look at the world in these, these like two hundred fifty years lenses, right? And so the world is changing. We have a two hundred fifty year revolution cycle, and there's a fifty year technological revolution cycle. So every fifty years, about plus or minus, we have a new technological revolution, not a technology. A revolution is something that changes the way that humanity works, the way the world works. And so there's been five. And so uh, we go back to the industrial revolution, brought people from the farms in fact, uh, farms into cities, into factories. It changed the way the world worked. Then we had um, steam engines and steel. For all of humanity, we had horsepower, manpower. Now we had steam engines and we had steel. We could build skyscrapers and bridges. That was that changed humanity. Um, then fast forward, we had electricity. Of course, electricity changed the world at the time. What do we need electricity for? It's like, what is it? It's like a digital candle. But candles have been fire for 5,000 years. And look, it's, I can pick the candle up and move it. It's portable. It's way better than this stupid digital candle. And a digital candle light was the killer app for electricity then. But of course, now it's so much more. Um, then we had oil and automobiles and assembly lines. 1971, we had the microprocessor, which created computers, the internet, telecommunications, what we're doing now. Um, and 1971 plus 50 years puts us right here today. And we're witnessing another technological revolution, not a technology. A technology is like an iPhone. I'm talking about a revolution that changes the way the world works, like those five I just said. And so if you look at that 50 years um, merging with this 250 year revolution cycle, now what um, what's happening is that if you look at the mega politics, and so I know this is a long lens here, but you had um, after the Roman Empire fell from uh, 1000 to 1500, um, you basically you had madness, you had chaos, you had the medieval times <clears throat> and um, everyone was spread out across the the, the, the farms and you had the feudal society. The church kind of came in, brought order to that. And over from 1000 to 1500, um, the church basically amassed this power and they had complete control, top down control. Um, if you, uh, you know, the only way to get to God was through the church, et cetera. And that led to the Protestant Reformation that we talked about in 1500. And a couple key pieces of this, what happened is what broke the church's grip was that the printing press was developed. That was a new technology. And it, and it, and it uh, decentralized information. And now everybody could get the information they need, and it broke the church's grip. And then no matter what the church did to try to hang on to this, this is a key piece, <clears throat> they tried to fight this. If anybody read the Bible or talked out about it, they were called heretics or heresy, and they were, they were killed. You couldn't talk out anything. And they were instantly killed and lots of people died, but it didn't matter because the, the, the information was out. The internet was too big. The information was out. There was nothing the church could do to stop it. And eventually they, they fail. And that's a key piece. So that was a technological innovation. Then what happened is then we had this explosion of, uh, of new technologies and science because now people could actually think and actually use communication. And that led to the Renaissance age, which is the greatest explosion of, of uh, humanity that we've seen. Um, then all that new technology led in the late 1700s, as I said, the technological revolution was the industrial revolution. And then that changed the world again, right? So the world started centralizing. So now everybody started centralizing in cities and building huge cities and factories. Um, and so that led to the United States industrializing, of course, Europe industrializing. And then we have these giant cities that were built based off these industrial hubs. And what's key about this is that it created centralization. And so when I have these massive cities and these massive factories, um, it's easy for a government to squeeze that. It's easy for the government to go, well, I'm going to extract my taxes. I'm going to take what I want, like a mob, right? Like uh, if you lived in New York and the mob's like, hey, if you have your bakery here, I, I want you to pay me for protection. You, um, same with that factory. You can't just pick up and move your factory. But here's the key piece. The world is changing today. This is the big macro lens. The world is changing. The internet, like the printing press before it, is a technology that changed the world. Um, going back to the stupidity of the leaders, just like the church tried to hide the information, but the printing press 
decentralized it. Today, the internet has done that. And we see these idiot leaders and they just can't hide it. Like you, <laughs> the, Joe Rogan has got the word out to hundreds of millions of people. The government can't hide it. And so no matter how much they try, just like the church, they're, they're assassinating people online, right? But they can't stop it. So that's one piece. Now, um, the world is continuing to decentralize. Um, and we don't we don't have to live before you'd have to live in America if you want to make money or have to live in a city because that's where the jobs are today. And the pandemic really sped this up. I can live anywhere I want, which is why real estate in Montana and Idaho and Wyoming is taking off. But now I can also live anywhere I want in the world. And as the world continues to decentralize, instead of having these giant buildings and factories, my team is decentralized. Now it's a bunch of small companies. And now the state, it's, it's harder for the, the nation state to squeeze those companies. Now I could go live in El Salvador or Mexico or wherever I want, but the problem is the money is still centralized. So even if I leave and even if I start a small business and even if my team is decentralized, they can't squeeze me from a, from a location level, tyranny of location, I call it, but they still can take my money. And so Bitcoin, or if you want to just table that, cryptocurrency, um, allows me to take my money out of the reach of the government. And this is, when you look at this from a long lens, this is something that cannot be stopped. The world centralized because of the industrial revolution, because of technology, but new technology is decentralizing it. The internet has started it, and the cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is the second piece to that. And it's a massive trend that I think uh, people should right. have to do. Yeah, no, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, because, you know, there's work from home. Everyone's so excited about work from home because, you know, you can work from home and not, you don't have to go to work. And then the next iteration of that is you go work from somewhere you actually want to work from, like Montana. That's beautiful. The next iteration of that is you hire a bunch of guys in India because they're a tenth the price. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's like what we did with uh, offshoring factories. And, um, you know, the, the problem remains, though, that, you know, when you have a knowledge industry like you and I are in, it's harder to offshore us. We're going to offshore ourselves in a way. And I think we kind of have, but you know, they can still control the money. So having a workaround for that solves for a lot of things. Um, and I, I think you make great points about it. You, you have the most uh, eloquent uh, bull thesis of uh, Bitcoin I've heard from anyone. Whereas most people just say uh, stock chart, buy it, you know, price, yeah. you know, price graph, buy it. You, I mean, you have kind of like the theoretical underpinnings of why you think it's uh, going to prosper. Um, yeah, and it's, just, it's just a big long lens and it's just a big trend. And I think, uh, you know, just like when uh, when when Weimar Republic happened and you look at the, the the German mark to the gold, it looks like it was a hockey stick. Like, oh, I could have bought it here and sold it here. But but the truth is, if you zoom in, there was massive volatility. And so, you know, the future is volatile. But I think over a long lens, that's what happens. How do you think about the volatility? I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, there's been multiple of these, you know, pretty massive cycles. Like it's a hockey stick to the upside with lots of 30 and 40 percent pullbacks. But, you know, that, that's in, within each of these cycles. But there's been these huge cycles where it's 10, 20 baggered and then it's you know dropped 80 percent. And it's happened a few times. And if you, if you think of Bitcoin, you know, how I do as a portfolio manager, as opposed to, you know, I guess a futurist, um, you know, it, it seems to be very, very uh, exposed to what's happening with uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, money supply and printing and interest rates. It, it seems just the most uh, susceptible to small changes in the direction of the Federal Reserve. You know, the Federal Reserve is, is a first derivative and a second derivative, and Bitcoin seems to live out there on the second or even third derivative of what the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve is doing. Do you try to trade around Bitcoin? Do you just... Hodel, I mean, how do you think about it conceptually? Because I know you own quite a lot of them. I mean, the way, the, the way that I look at it is um, there was a study that I read just recently, and I forget the name of the study, but it said that the more information an investor gets, the worse their performance does. And the reason why is because they start over trading it. And uh, I remember Warren Buffett said that if a new trader came into, the, into his career and he knew he only had 20 moves his entire career, he would outperform everybody. And uh, of course, his partner, Charlie Munger, said that the big money's not made in the buying and the selling. The big money's made in the waiting. And so I think about it in those terms. And so, you know, you can trade in and out and, and uh, obviously you can do really well that way, but the big money is made in the waiting. And so you identify these really big trends you get in early and then you just wait for the trend to develop. And of course, as I said, like even when uh, Weimar Republic was was hyperinflating, um, the gold trade looked like amazing. But in, in the short term, it was extremely volatile. Uh, 
Um, but the big money is made in the waiting. So you get in the trend early and you wait. Um, if you look back to Bitcoin, if you look at Bitcoin over the last you know 11 years, it's averaged a 200% compound annual growth rate. Every single year, the lowest point of the year has been higher. Now, in 20, except for 2015, it was a little bit lower, but every other year, the lowest point of the year has always been higher. So when you zoom out, the volatility kind of um, goes away, kind of like the gold mark trade in, in Weimar Republic. Um, so the way I look at it is this is a big decade long trend. Um, I'm just, as you said, hodling, I'm holding, uh, I'm in position and I'm just holding all the way through. I believe over the next, you know, 10 years, it's going to do amazing over the next five years it's going to do amazing. Um, and I'm so I'm not worried about it now. Um, as someone who's a trader, kind of more a trader investor, like you are, um, that volatility presents opportunities. I think, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to do that. And I think one of the reasons why it seems, I think you just said it's a little bit more tied to the traditional market today than it kind of ever has been before is because of all these big institutions that have come into the, into the space and they're trying to trade it very similar to how they do the rest of the market. And so it's caused that correlation. Um, and uh, one of the things I think, and, I, and I've talked to you about this several times offline, is that I think one advantage that you or other people like you would have is that um, unlike any other asset, Bitcoin is an open source network. So you can see all this on-chain data. You can see how old the coins are that moving. So that tells you, is it is it new entrants? Is it is it longtime holders? Um, you can see price floors. So you can see where people got in at. You can, you know, all these different metrics. Um, and I, and I, I think it creates a, a superior advantage for people. Um, but anyway, for me, I think it's a long-term trend. I know it's going to be super volatile. If you zoom out, the price is always going up and I'm just going to wait. So you're really not thinking about, you know, the, the, the trade on it. And if you thought that tomorrow might drop into the 10,000, you're not going to do anything to adjust your portfolio. You're just going to take it kind of. Uh, but that's just because I don't have any way to know that it's going to drop $10,000. And to your point, I mean, it is volatile and it could drop 10000 but it could also go 10000 up as well. And so we, we've seen lots of $10,000 swings up and down, you know, just the, the, the old, uh, the old, uh, the old saying is it's not time in the market, it's time in the market. And you see these studies where it's like, if you miss the best 30 days, you know, over the last 30 years, what your performance, um, what happens to your performance and Bitcoin's kind of the same way. Cause you get these big, like $10,000 swings. If you miss that swing, then, uh, I mean, that's really going to wreck your portfolio. And so since I don't know the short term, I feel good about the long term. Um, and then the other thing is that, um, you know, when you look at different assets, they're all a little bit different. And so when you're looking at a commodity, you would measure that different than you would a tech play, obviously. Um, <laughs> I know we've both been laughing at Kathy Wood and some of the stuff she's been spinning <laughs> on lately. Uh, side note. But um, what I look at as a technology is that um, the price to me seems as a short term distraction. And really what I'm looking for is I'm looking for network growth. And I'm looking for development on the network. So let me give you an example of that. Um, when Uber went live, you know, a decade ago, imagine if the price was mark to market on a daily basis, if, the, if there was a live price. Um, but it wasn't, right? Because it was a venture deal. We didn't see the price for, for 10 years or whatever. But imagine if, if, if it went live on day one and like, oh, Uber moved into Austin. Oh, San Francisco shut Uber down. <laughs> Boom, the price drops, right? Oh, Uber just, uh, now they're going to do meal delivery. Price goes up. Oh, now New York City is fighting Uber. <laughs> price goes down, right? And imagine if every single piece of news was moving Uber on a daily basis, but on a new technology, you're looking for really network growth. Is the, is the technology being used? Are we getting more users into the space? Um, and then what's the development? Is it growing? Are there new advancements and things like that? And so I think um, that's what I try to focus on more than the, than the daily price. That, that makes you know perfect sense. That's kind of how I think about a lot of trends too, you know, uranium went up, people got really, you know, too optimistic, I guess. They, they thought uh, Grayscale was going to corner the whole market in a weekend. And then it turns out, you know, the market's a little bigger than some people might have expected and it pulled all the way back and I bought a bunch more and, you know. And the, I don't know if you can say, but I mean, are you trading in and out of that or you're just um, buying on the dips because the trend is still in place? Oh, I, I just buy on the dips. I've never sold. Okay. I mean, yeah. one day, you know, some utility is going to call up a warehouse and say, I need 100,000 pounds. And the, the warehouse is going to say, go fish. And, you know, uranium is going to be 1,000 or whatever crazy number. And I don't know when that's going to happen. So I'm, not, I'm definitely not selling. Um, I mean, the move, I mean, it hasn't really even started moving. It's just kind of like flopping around between 40 and 50. Uh, but on the pullbacks, I, I keep adding, you know, I have a fund with inflows and, I have an event-driven book that produces, you know, pretty consistent uh, cash flow, and 
I got to put that money to work and I'm going to put it to work in the things I like the most, especially on pullbacks. You know, that, that cash flow gives me the flexibility to buy the pullbacks when it trades at a discount to NAV. Um, let, let's talk about uh, one other theme. I mean, what else are you really excited about from uh, an investment perspective? Is there anything else that really has you excited? I mean, I think that's the biggest trade, uh, the biggest trend, um, not just of my lifetime, but I think of multiple lifetimes in reality. And that's because it's, a, as I said, it's not a new technology, it's a technological revolution. And so if you look at each technological revolution, as I laid them out, right, um, the it's it's different people making money. So obviously the people that got money in the um, in the personal computer, telecommunication, internet space are different than the people that got rich in the automobile oil space. And that's different than the people that got rich in the steel and steam engine space. Um, and so I, I really think we're on the verge of something that big. So it's, it's pretty hard for me to um, really be excited about anything else that big. Um, so that's definitely the biggest thing. And, and it's not just because the technology, like I said, it's, it's actually the three cycles converging. So the financial system is being reset. They've told us that, as I said, right, they've, they've called for that. So the financial system is being reset. Um, we, we're seeing this revolution cycle happening. So the world is continuing to like, uh, the governments are continuing to squeeze, but we're seeing people pushing back all over the world. And then we have the technological revolution cycle. So that's the biggest thing uh, going. I think other than that, I think um, on, a, on a kind of a smaller lens, the other things that I'm kind of focusing on are energy and and gold still. Um, gold, you know, I think gold is, as I, as I kind of made the case, gold failed because of the centralization aspect. Um, but that doesn't mean it just dies right away. I still think gold is going to be a good trade specifically in some of the gold miners, you know, where you can earn uh, big, big rev multiples off of that. Um, and so I would say probably gold and energy are probably the two other areas that I'm kind of excited about. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, gold's kind of been forgotten about for over a year now. And I think it's shaken out a lot of the speculative interest. I, I, I think it's going to have its moments. I, I don't know when, but I think in 22, it'll have its moment, probably you know, in the fall or something. Well, while, while I have you on, let's, let me ask you one last thing, because you know, we, we talked early on about governments making stupid mistakes. Um, I'm watching what's happening in Ukraine. And I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little concerned. I'm, you know, it seems like Biden wants to have his own little uh, Cuban missile crisis around the, the Russian border. And, you know, as you know from Kennedy, Kennedy basically refused to back down. And he said, we'll nuke you back. And eventually the Russians backed down. And Putin's basically said he's not backing down. You guys, you know, can't uh, take over this country right on our border. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Why, in the first place, are you know NATO and the U.S. in particular so focused on Russia? Because to me, Russia is just a place that doesn't really do much to me. I don't really think about Russia much. I'm I'm not particularly scared of Russia. I'm, I'm more scared about you know some crazy guy on the street, uh, you know, all you know drugged up. Like, yeah. I Why think, do you think um, we care so much? Why are we poking at them? And what do you think ultimately happens? Because Russia's 11 million barrels of uh, oil a day. If there's a, you know, if, if there's some sort of uh, event, I mean, it, it's all got, ties back to energy. I think it's, um, you know, war. It's war. So war seems to come every time there's a financial crisis. And usually after the financial crisis, uh, if you go back and look at most of the wars that we've gone into, I mean, look at Vietnam. I mean, look at uh, look at, uh, you know, the Middle East war. Um, they come after the financial crisis starts. And so I think, you know, we're obviously in this massive financial crisis, as we've been talking about this whole hour. And so war seems to be the the next step. I mean, that, if that that's historically how it's been. I, I would say that's 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 big. Um, on top of that, I think you know the whole world met at Glasgow uh, for the COP twenty six climate meeting. Uh, was it a couple months ago, two months ago, or whatever now? And um, China and Russia didn't show up. So you know you got kind of got this whole world kind of united. Um, and Russia just doesn't seem to want to play in this, uh, you know, global centralization, globalization role. So I think there's there's that. Um, ultimately, I, I guess you asked, what do I think happens? I mean, I don't know Putin, obviously, from what I have observed. He doesn't look like somebody that's going to be pushed around and bullied. Um, he's got Europe and NATO by the balls, if you, if I can say that on this uh, without getting uh, without getting uh, bleeped out there. Um, you know, 
as we've said, right, the European nations have literally cut their own throats. I mean, they've literally shut off their own energy. They've literally put their own policies in place that have completely hamstrung them. And now they're 100 percent dependent on Russia. And uh, I mean, now they're playing this like uh, this game where it's like they want Germany wants Russia to turn on the pipeline. Um, Russia doesn't want to turn on and the U S is like, Hey, Russia, you need to turn on the pipeline so we can sanction you. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, Russia, hurry up and turn that pipeline so we can sanction you. And like, what is Russia going to do? Like, no, I'm not going to sanction you. So, um, or no, I'm not going to take your sanctions. And so, um, uh, ultimately I guess to, in, in, back to the Ukraine thing, um, uh, I just don't see any way that the U S, um, I don't know, man. Uh, it's, it's, we're kind of uh, all across the board. We're in these like uh, very bad situations where there's no good outcome. And, uh, you know, I, I could almost see NATO breaking apart because these other U EU nations need that energy and they're not going to want to side with the U S over that. And, uh, Biden's weak. I'm yeah. Biden's weak and, and Putin's strong. And so ultimately I would guess he's probably going to continue to posture. Uh, he's probably going to slap some tariffs and sanctions that don't really mean anything. Putin's going to agree to him and, and it's probably going to end up going away would be my guess. So you think it goes away? I mean, Putin has a hundred thousand troops on the border in the middle of a winter, you think that's just part of that's, that's theater, or do you think he's going to try to take some of the eastern provinces of Ukraine that are technically, I guess, you know, Russian language, Russian ethnic? Uh, they actually probably want to be part of Russia. Uh, no, my my guess isn't isn't that it's not just theater. My guess is he'll probably take a little bit. You know, um, he probably won't go too far. You know, we'll threaten, we'll jostle back a little bit, back and forth. Um, and he'll probably, like I said, we'll probably agree to something, you know, he'll take a little bit of play, a little bit of land, a few people, uh, he'll agree to a little bit of sanctions that don't really mean anything to him. And we'll just kind of like back down off of it. The reason you why I say that is, um, again, looking at this from a really zoomed out lens, um, I don't, all of these nations are, are managing on a, on a micro level. The game's being played at a much higher level, in my opinion, um, I think the leaders uh, above that, and this gets a little conspiratorial or uh, controversial or whatever, but I think uh, the leaders above are the ones pulling the strings and they like to use war um, because war, like I said, one can help them cover up a lot of these financial revolution cycles that we're dealing with. Uh, but it also creates this like nationalism and they want like to always have this us versus them going. And so like, oh, yeah, Russia's bad. Russia's bad. We're U Team USA, right? Just like they do on a, on a smaller level, right? Strays and gays and uh, blacks and whites and whatever. Um, and so if they continue to like kind of keep this rivalry going and then we're, the nationalism kicks in and we feel patriotic, it, it kind of brings us together a little bit. Um, so I think it's theater, to your point. I think it's a big game. I think uh, – He'll probably take a little bit of land. Uh, he'll concede to take a little bit of sanctions. Uh, we'll, Biden will feel like he saved face with the people, um, and then it probably just kind of dies out. I don't. I don't think it leads to World War Three and nukes. So you don't think Biden escalates? You think it just kind of plods its way forward? That's my guess, uh, just based off of like I said, Biden's weak. Uh, we don't really have anything to stand on. If we if we if 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 we push too hard, we could risk breaking NATO apart. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think it just kind of dies out. Everybody gets a little bit of pound of flesh and feels like they're happy and then it goes away. Sounds like a good outcome. Why do you I'm, think I'm not a, I'm not a big believer in uh world war three, as far as, uh, the world going back to war and guns and nukes and China and this and that. I, I don't, I don't see that future. I see, I, I think we're already in world war three. I think World War Three is happening right now, and I think World War Three is the people versus the governments, the globalization. Um, I think it's fought over information and money, which is what it's typically been fought over. I think it continues to escalate for the next probably four years, um, and uh, at which it will climax, and then I think the world will start opening back up again. I hope so. I want to have a happy, peaceful place. It's kind of been a weird two years with this COVID stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're two years into the war. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, I appreciate you taking some time. Um, it, it's really been interesting. I always learn a ton when I talk to you. And like I said, we've had plenty of late nights. You, you make me think of the world in a way that I don't always think about it. You, you definitely have unique views and you come at it from a very different perspective. So I, I always really do appreciate your time. Um, where can people find you? Uh, 
market disruptors uh, just give some uh, urls or you know your site where should people find you if they want to learn more yeah i mean the best place is just go to my website onemarkmoss.com it's just the number one onemarkmoss.com um and you'll see everything linked there i make a couple of videos a week on youtube i have a, a radio show that i do uh, once a week on the weekends on the iheart radio network um i've been running events now the market disruptors live events um which i have a i'm, I'm holding one you're gonna love this one cuppy we're doing um I'm doing the Marcus Ruppers in uh, Dallas, Texas in May 6. And the reason why I chose Dallas, Texas is because there's been three presidents that have been assassinated and three presidents that went up against the Fed. And uh, everybody wants to know what happened with JFK. I think he said he was going to splinter the Fed into a thousand pieces. He ended up with a bullet in his head. And we're going to have the event. We're going to have the event right at the location where um, that happened. Um, and uh, I got RFK Jr. agreed to come speak. Oh, wow. Congrats. So uh, anyway, yeah, just go to my website. You'll find all that stuff. Sounds great. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time. It's been uh, great, and I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Thanks, Cappy. Always fun talking to you. All right, Patrick, we're going to do a talking charts. What do you have for us? Okay, let's quickly go through the top uh, three things we were watching last week. OPEX, well, I think the gamma did kick in, didn't it? I, I think the gamma did kick in. And what I think was even more interesting was the fact that we had the second largest amount of single stock options expiring in history. Yeah. And it, I'm assuming that a fair amount of those were actually single stocks. They often are calls that they buy. I think it was part of the reason for the weakness. There's more to it than that, but I think it definitely contributed. For sure. Uh, number two thing we were watching was uh, the Euro USD. We even bet on that. We'll, t we'll settle it next week. But uh, uh, the Euro uh, has uh, actually weakened a little bit off of that pop. Uh, you, but US dollar really hasn't uh, taken off the way you would imagine if this was really a, a true risk off uh, impulse. But uh, nonetheless, a little bit of weakness in that euro. And the last thing we were asking, does the market have another leg higher? We nurtured it. Well, no, because we didn't think so. Uh, so oh, is that what we said? We, I can't we, remember. Yeah, we 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 basically were at a pretty kind of key level where uh, we were at near that forty seven hundred level where we thought the markets uh, uh, had to beat that level for the bulls to be able to take it over, and clearly. Uh, the market's just been uh, uh, selling all week long. I will talk, pull up a chart of that in just a moment, but let's quickly cover the top three things to watch next week. Number one, I wanted to watch the uh, the breakout and the breakdown in uh, precious metals and uh, and the, the cryptos. So what's interesting is is that gold had a pretty interesting breakout and is starting to to rally higher. But actually, most of the um, uh, most of the precious metals in general have been working higher. Like silver uh, beat uh, that 24 level, which was, was an important fib zone in my mind that really kind of solidified a turn. But uh, you take uh, palladium, uh, really seemed to have turned the corner. That, that was a bad tick on this chart in terms of uh, seeing what's uh, happening there. But even uh, platinum uh, trying to show some life. So suddenly precious metals are working. And it's interesting because it's a complete reverse because at the same time as precious metals are finally getting a little bit of love, uh, the crypto's not. And uh, and obviously, uh, Bitcoin took a very bad hit when that 40, 42,000 support line, which was pretty critical in my mind, gave out. Uh, we're down at thir the 36,000 level, and it's going to be trading all weekend long in a thinly traded market. Like, uh, are we going to see 30,000 by uh, next week? Like, unbelievable that the, the, just the magnitude and speed of this decline. Uh, you have any insights on those views? I am going to plead the fifth because I have large positions in both, as you know, and I do not want to be doing any gochering. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I think, nonetheless, it is definitely something to watch next week. I mean, that's really why we put it on this list, because uh, both of them are acting interesting. For once, gold and precious metals seem to be have almost a safe haven kind of element to them. Uh, and uh, and Bitcoin is definitely being sold. Well, was interesting. Did you see, by the way, MSTR? Yeah, uh, you're just gonna gucci all my trades, aren't you? Oh my yeah, god! Yes. Don't tell yes. me you were you were you were heavily short. So you're happy today? Are you taking uh, me out for dinner? I do or not want to say anything, but uh, yes, I did notice that. Uh, <laughs> you did notice was, <laughs> that there was uh, there was. I'm some not going to say anything. about some uh, accounting issues about the way they're accounting for crypto yeah. and stuff. All right. So uh, number two, uh, next week is the FOMC Bank of Canada as well going to be uh, up, up out there. Uh, what's, what's your take on what's uh, going to happen next week? 
I don't know. I'm thinking that it's getting to the point where the Fed can actually err on being a little more dovish than the market expects. Yeah, I know that's th- I know that's that's sacrilege, and everyone's telling me that the Fed's well, going to do a fifty. Like there's this crazy shit that people think they're going to do a fifty. Not a chance they're going to do a fifty. Let's just stop and think about this. They are currently doing quantitative easing. They haven't even tapered yet, and people think they're going to do a fifty. So if there was any it, but surprise. It is- it would be a, a, the only thing that could be a surprise, and I don't even think it's that much of a surprise. They could taper immediately this me- meeting. They could say, oh, you know what? We only have two more months of this. This is bullshit. We're going to stop. And they should. They should. The reality is that they're doing 1.7 or whatever trillion dollars of reverse repos to just try to suck up uh, you know, excess liquidity. The last thing they should be doing is buying extra through quantitative easing. So even though the market might take it badly, it, they shouldn't because it, it, it is needed. They should taper immediately. Right. I, I, you know, for me, wouldn't it be interesting if that became a turn point? So let's just say that the market just builds on this weakness and we come out of the gate Monday with just a, a big downdraft in the market and everything is just kind of hammering into Wednesday. And then suddenly a little bit of a dovish tone, maybe that uh, uh, reverses the incredibly oversold state of the market. Do you think maybe we have a turn point next week on something like that? It could happen. It could happen for sure. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm yeah. really curious of whether this, how much of this week was OPEX. And I think that a, a good judge of how much of this week was OPEX will be how we behave on Monday. Yeah. And I will say, Patrick, there was lots of rumors flying around about large tech funds being liquidated. Like wow. portfolios. So I know everyone's telling me that it didn't have enough of a kind of a capitulatory uh, feel to it today, but there's lots of signs okay. that we're close. Well, let's talk about because the one thing uh, that number one I put onto the list is obviously we have to be watching what happens here with equities, just literally to what you're saying. And you sort of uh, took the number one there, which is like this is the the single biggest downdraft of the markets that we have had. Uh, basically, maybe maybe the, comparable to uh, to August September of of 2020, but really you have to go the back to the actual COVID drop to have this kind of speed and momentum in the drop. And what was really interesting, I know there were a number of people tweeting as to why it was the case, but we haven't really seen things like the volatility index really blast off. For the magnitude of this drop, you would I, I would imagine that there would be a lot more anxiety and more grabbing at, at some put hedges and protection, and it just doesn't seem to be reflected in the VIX. Do you, do you have an opinion I on that? No, I no. The VIX is, what is it? It's almost 30, right? Yeah, yeah, but we okay. Stop for a second. We were at thirty five. Just like look, okay, go back to this chart here. We hit thirty five, thirty six during this little downdraft right here. Okay, like that was that was what drove thirty six VIX. Now suddenly we're we're dropping like this, and we're down at the we're at the twenty eight. Oh, it's the close. So to you know 30. what I'll tell you. You know what that means to me. That means that this was driven more likely by real selling as opposed to by hedging and by demand for like option related. It could be. It so could be. it could, it, you know, we, you get those spikes when you get demand for put protection and you get the demand for yeah. uh, options and, and people, uh, it ends up being a, a self fulfilling prophecy where the higher VIX goes, the more they have to sell because of the, uh, of the uh, which one is that? Is it Vanna? I can never remember yeah. the names of it. But it, I it, to me, when I see that and I see the fact that the VIX isn't going up as much, it it, it actually yeah. leads me to believe it was real selling, which isn't as big deal. But I will tell you one thing, Patrick Cameron Kreis uh, from uh, Bloomberg. He wrote a great piece today where he highlighted the fact that we had a little bit of inversion in the one. I think it was between the one and the four month, the first and the fourth month. I right. personally like to watch the second versus the seventh, and we haven't inverted there yet. But we're getting close. We're getting close. Oh, and then yeah. look at this. You're gonna is that the 200 day? 200 day moving average. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, basically uh, right after the COVID bottom, the market has been above the 200 day moving average every single trading day for basically now going on 18 months. Really, and, we we've never closed below the 200 day since the March 23rd. Bottom? Yeah, well, obvi- obviously. Oh no, the, since we since we rallied back up. Okay. Yeah, so, like so, uh, they, there was the dr- drop below and then yeah. the pop back above. But since the, about May June 
of um, of the uh, of 2020, we've been basically 18 months straight higher without violating the 200 day, and this we're testing it now. Have we legitimately broken below it? No, we are very oversold. It's a very logical place for a bounce. This is why Monday is, I think is really interesting because if this kind of uh, an oversold condition on the short term can't offer a reaction. Well, that tells you a lot about uh, about how much actual uh, selling their pressure there is. Do you know what would be hilarious, Patrick, is if uh, we get a, a Monday big gap down, which I don't think will happen, but let's just imagine we do. If uh, most people don't remember, and I don't remember that, but I read about it, in the 1987 crash, what happened was we had some bad action like this. It was yep. selling off. And everyone thought, oh, there we go. The, the, the correction is done. And then Monday, it gapped down. And most professional traders will buy the gap down. And, and then it, it never rallied stopped. a little bit and never, ever rallied from there. It took, I don't know how many years to fill that gap. But it was, well, I guess yeah. it would be a couple of years back yeah. in 1989. But the point is, it will be um, some white knuckling if we get a gap through that. And it ends up being really scary on Monday morning. And I, uh, what yeah. would you do if you were a day trader? You don't day trade, and you always trade. You you're always I I would I would portfolios with uh, limited risk and stuff like that. But imagine you were your old your old case when you're a day trader and you're trying to flip around S and P's. Market gaps down two percent Monday. Well, morning. of course you, you, you you fade it like yeah, uh, okay. you no 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 that's like that's a given, especially uh, when you're approaching those September lows. And that's the isn't that the irony? Like we were just trading here in September October. Uh, and we're only returning to those levels, but it feels so ugly when it's doing it, right? Well, uh, and I think the other reason it feels ugly is because a lot of people have been in the wrong stocks. And yeah. so you're seeing, even though the S&P is down only, what, 10% or whatever? Maybe, maybe, you, should, maybe you should write a little piece on uh, maybe I should. violent rot- rotation or yeah, something. I should. Maybe I should. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to think about that. <laughs> Anyway, what I wanted to highlight, though, is uh, just look at this. This is the percentage of stocks uh, above their 50-day moving averages, and it usually reflects really uh, oversold capitulation. And obviously, there's a lot of sectors, like the uh, many financials and energy stocks that are holding above their moving averages. But we are nowhere near as oversold on this indicator as we were back in November, December. We were we were down, uh, you know, in the low twenties, and we're still at thirty three percent above, uh, in spite of being substantially lower on the index. So, what's that telling you that if the selling is not as broad based? Yeah, it, well, uh, clearly, oh, no, it's the other way around. The selling is concentrated in in yes. Some big names. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. And yeah. so, so, uh, but, but the question is, uh, are we going to see some sort of kind of like a real scare moment where everything just has a one or two day dump just to scare the shit out of everyone, cause everything to capitulate? It's going to be to like spike. Sully, Sully coming out of the closet in Monsters Inc. Yeah. Scare and the ju- shit out of him, make everybody cry. Yeah. And, <laughs> All right. But listen, uh, highlighting the NASDAQ, it's an ugly one. Like uh, the NASDAQ is just getting uh, beaten up. But look, it's under its 200 day. Oh. It's, uh, and uh, and it, it's, it crossed above its 200 day much sooner. Like this is, this is now getting into some pretty ugly uh, charts and price action uh, on that. And what's also worthy of noting is how that Russell broke uh, down below the, that key support line. Well, see – we could have called. We should have called this, because I, if there's I no, actually, you did okay. Good yeah, for yeah. you, buddy. You're good for you. Um, the because if we if there's no such thing as a triple bottom, then there's definitely no such thing as an octo, octagonal bottom. <laughs> or how many? Well, listen. That? One, sub- two, three, four, five. I, Six, seven, I eight. I hate when you yes. do this, but like you uh, a support line like it's bottoms are at the bottom of markets, not uh, and okay. like a, a consolidating along the top and calling that that uh, support line a bottom. I I think you're misplacing technically where the, where that statement yeah. should be used, well. but but the point being that it was a major support line that was broken, and it's ugly. Um, you you it, remind me so much of Will Arnett with his magician's uh, alliance yeah. t- demanding to be taken seriously. Take me seriously, <laughs> Kevin. Take <laughs> me seriously. <laughs> the uh, but uh, what uh, uh, just uh, so anyway, I wanted to just look at that chart on Bitcoin, right? Like oh, uh, 
like at this stage, uh, I don't I don't know what's gonna stop it from uh, turning before a, a full retest is pretty. Sorry, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna yeah. stop. Let's next next <laughs> thing. Uh, the um, crude oil. Uh, I'm. What's interesting is is that um, on the continuous contract, it just kind of prairie dog that previous high. Now. Uh, obvi- um, obviously, uh, there's all the talk of uh, of Cushing and uh, and March oil contract delivery and whether or not there was going to be this huge steepening at the front of the curve. But the whole curve is not rising as much as the front. It is a uh, it is a general steepening of the backwardation. And the question is is that can oil just keep ripping when the rest of the market is under this kind of pressure? Will we see that the stresses start to to kind of spill over? I mean. I'm not. If there's any one market that can march the beat of its own drum, it's oil. Uh, but uh, you know, I think it's overdue for a throwback. I would not be shocked if we saw a throwback to like 80 for a buy on dip. I don't know whether this thing is going to like dump into the mid 70s. But I, after you know, 20 plus dollar run on the upside in a month, it's uh, there's a point where the rally will get checked. Yeah, I, I've heard that there's people with oil barrel eyes out there, and that kind of scares me. But I am going to take uh, some. Uh, issue with your calling that a prairie dog you were getting mad at my technical analysis before that is not a prairie dog because what is that because a prairie dog has to have like the prairie it has to be a longer spot like that it's trying to do and it breaks out from there that's just like a, a, a breakout of a previous high. That's it was a, a close dog. at a higher high. Yeah, don't get, it, oh my no, no, God. No, the, no, no, it has to be in a why range. Why don't you, okay, why don't you. It has to be in a you, range, and then it has to poke its head up, and then come back down into the range. No, I want, to see, I, want, I want the definition. You're going to write out the definition of a prairie dog, <laughs> because <laughs> because this is ridiculous. This is a prairie dog, as textbook as it comes. Hey, is, there, is there an alliance of the magicians that we can send it to? Like, do they keep all the different uh Well, we're going to, we're, Everywhere? I'm gonna st- no. We're gonna have a new market huddle uh, glossary summary. Thing we should on the website. You know what? We should. And then what? What we'll do? Let's both um, submit charts that we think are prairie dogs. You will submit this one. I will come up with the true prairie dog. And we'll oh, true! Them. Like you're the authority on prairie dogs. <laughs> Listen, the true who's prairie from, who's dog. Who's from Winnipeg? Who's from Winnipeg? You are. Yes, exactly. And where are prairie dogs from? <sighs> They're not from Ontario. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that doesn't mean that. Oh my, okay, whatever. All right, you know what? Let's just keep talking, Charles. But uh, you're you're terribly wrong. Anyway, uh, what uh, what I was uh, also wanted to just highlight here. Uh, I, obviously, okay. Let's we already looked at gold and stuff, so I'm not going to bother going back there. But what I wanted to just touch on is uh, just some of these treasury bonds. And was what I find interesting is that uh, with the market uh, as uh, usually we've seen in the past where the bond markets would tend to almost signal the move for equities first. And it seems that uh, um, that equities are moving and then bonds are almost responding to equities. It's almost like, have, am I wrong on that observation? Like, because I've seen in the past where bonds will lead the move on equities even weeks in advance and then the equities finally crack. But it seems to me like, the, like usually these bonds should be already rallying as yields come off when there's these risk off impulses. And it doesn't feel like bonds give a shit right now. It, it is a little bit different. And, and part of the reason that the stock market's in trouble is because they're worried about higher rates. So the stock well, market in, has to inevitably, go down a lot. Yeah, the, st- yeah. the stock market has to go down a lot for them to not worry about higher rates. And, and Alex touched on this. He said, the reality is that the Fed's probably not going to change their tune based upon the stock market going down 10%. Yeah, let's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. The other interesting thing is this, uh, is the Nikkei going to be the next um, Russell? Oh, there you go. Now, I won't say that that's another a quadruple bottom. It's not, no, 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 but it's, it's not the, it's, it's, but, but it's not as failed clean rallies. As... It's fa- failed rallies along a key support line and just the Nikkei can't get any love. Well, it's tough in this market, though. For anything, yeah, like, is there but, any stock market that's going up right now? 
Well, you know what? Look at the Euro stock has held up much better. Oh, that's true. Uh, like the, the, the Euro stocks held up. And even though there's been some weakness in emerging markets, they, this isn't where the heavy selling has been. Uh, in, well, it has been for the most of the year, but not since the market turned. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, you know, actually, the, today was a bad day on the Canadian TSS. Yes, it That's, was. Uh, up but I mean, it, up, up until today, the Canadian market was holding up very well, right? Uh, and so we'll see. But you know what? L look at the only green index out of the entire global global equity basket brazil <laughs> isn't that great. interesting lovely people great place it's cheap by the way when you said the heavy selling all i could think about is um when i was in my 20s on the trading desk uh my boss who wasn't that much older than me is probably five years older or six four years older uh so i'm like 27 he's 31 and uh it was during long-term capital and it was, I was getting crushed, and I was having all this this selling kept coming and coming. I was bidding for baskets, and then the guys would sell them to me, and then I would have to sell that stock I bought, and then I'd have to sell my gamma that I go was getting long. And so then I turned around, and next thing I know, it's even lower, so I'm even longer gamma. And then he's back on the phone trying to sell. And we were just getting crushed. It was just a terrible afternoon. And my boss came up behind me, and he said, I don't think the hard stuff's going to come down for a while yet. I'd keep playing. And it's from, you don't know this because you don't watch things. It's Caddyshack, and it's Carl Spackler when he's talking about um, playing golf with the priest. <laughs> and so whenever someone says that the hard stuff or the heavy stuff's coming down, I always think that's all I can think about. So now all I can imagine is that it's just going to be like 1998, and it's, this is just the, the hard stuff's not going to come down. I keep playing. Because he eventually <laughs> the, the priest gets killed by lightning, but that's mm -hmm. another story for another day. Well, one one thing uh, that's a great story, but uh, one thing we'll say is that next week's talking charts will uh, be uh, a lot to absorb because obviously one more week of information in this kind of a market environment is uh, it's going to reveal a lot. So looking forward to catching up with you on this next week. All right, let's uh, let's give it a wrap uh, for for the episode. That's it for this week's special episode. We'll be back to our normal show format next week. Uh, we hope all you huddlers have a great week. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me uh, at bigpicturetrading.com or follow me on Twitter at Patrick Sarasna. And Kev, where can they follow you, bud? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Kevin Muir. You can check out my letter at themacrotourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together. So see you next week.